The scene begins with a group of high school students who find themselves in an unknown place after their teacher leaves for a while. They discover that their phones don't work, and in front of them is a winged girl who claims to be a goddess. She tells them that they have been summoned to save the fantasy world, and they will soon be taken to the Shrine of Fantasia to meet the saint who received the prophecy. The students start asking questions about what they can expect in the fantasy world. One student, Oh Han Wu, asks about levels and skills, while Jiang Mi Yan asks about knights and the medieval aspects. Choi Kang Min wonders if any of them will become real heroes. No, because not everyone is endowed with equal power, and only after receiving the recognition and blessing of the gods, they will be able to become heroes. The class president, Ubora, raises the most important question of when they will return home. The goddess does not have an exact answer to this. She simply says that if in the future heroes defeat the demon lord, then the gods who who gave them blessings will fulfill their wishes. However, the students continue to ask questions, but the goddess provides less and less specific information. The main character, Kang Han Su, finally raises his hand and asks to be sent home, stating that he is not a fighter and has no place in this world. However, the goddess asks why they would turn a blind eye to the world's misfortunes and continue their normal lives. Kang Han Su responds that he cannot become a hero because he worries about his family. The goddess then announces that anyone who wishes to return home should tell her right away. As a result, the main character is left alone at the portal, and when he enters the portal, he finds himself in an unfamiliar place far from school, near a forest. He hears rustling and discovers huge werewolves who have already feasted on an elf and are now targeting him. Meanwhile, the other classmates end up in the Shrine of Fantasia, where they are met the saint and a swordmaster named Alsus and Princess Athena, who is an archmage. Ohan immediately started checking the status window before a lot of messages from various gods began to pop up, such as a certain god evaluates heroes and offering favor to those who they deem worthy. Those who are not favored will not be needed. In this new world, the student's adventure begins. Meanwhile, as Han Su is running from the monsters, he accessed his status window and discovered a curse called Hero, which automatically translated hostile monsters' languages and reduced his hunting and achievement experience. However, his attempts at communication with the monsters were met with hostility. While running, he heard an unfamiliar language and was suddenly struck by an arrow. A fight broke out between the werewolves and the elves, giving Hansu an opportunity to escape. But as he crawled away, he realized he was in dire straits and would rather die than pray to the goddess who put him in this situation. At that moment, a boy looked out from behind a tree, invisible to his eyes. A certain god was peeping. God was already openly spying on him, and the guy being on the verge of death tearfully asked to be saved. Windows with inscriptions continued to appear. At first they asked him why he was alone, and not having received a specific answer, they were confused. There were no other gods here. The word outsider came off the tongue, but the boy in the hood did not understand it. Hansu, who was lying about being a lone wolf running around in a mountainous area, the god likes this term, Hansu himself, is not the same, but lies in order to get help, and it really works. A certain god helped him, the arrow split, and his body felt much better. Next to the blessing, an outsider F appeared, and Hansu learned that all his stats, except death, would be reset and terrible things would happen if he left the wilderness. But with his health restored, Hansu decided to make a run for it. As he fled, the wolves launched a stone at him, causing him to stumble. Despite this setback, he continued on his way until he encountered a cliff. The only way to survive was to jump, risking death either from the fall or from his pursuers. Desperate, Hansu turned to the monsters and offered them something new. He promised to give his most delicious body parts to whoever caught him first. Immediately. All the werewolves rushed towards him, ready to tear him apart. As they closed in on him, the Hansu fell backward, hugging their massive bodies and tumbling over them. The force of the collision with the ground was so strong that a column of smoke and dust flew everywhere. Soon, when all this dissipated, Hansu was breathing heavily, lying on the corpses of monsters. A certain god admired his survival skills, even though the guy himself said that there was nothing special about it. Hansu barely gets up before he hears one of the werewolves still muttering meat, trying to reach him and stab him with a dagger. Unexpectedly, his status window opens and shows the werewolf's stats, which is at level 3 Blue Moon Butcher. Maybe because of the level, 
the werewolf remained alive after falling from such a height. Apparently there will always be enemies stronger than heroes, as in typical MMORPGs. Hansu grabs the stone in his hand, intending to end the life of the werewolf. Meanwhile in the temple, the saint talks about blessings and levels. If the latter is enough to accumulate experience from slaying creatures with status windows, then it is difficult to achieve the former. High school students almost do not listen to her, thinking that having received such power, they will become invincible. But many people get tense when uh, the saint says that the gods will constantly watch them, even in a dream, even in the shower. But there is nothing vulgar about it. Jung Miyan sees it in a more positive way, for which she even receives a blessing charm, F. But a certain goddess does not like that. She begins to use her charm left and right. So Jiang Miyan receives a curse punishment, F. The saint says that as soon as a person receives a curse or blessing, it will not disappear until death itself. Also, the higher the rank, the stronger the effect, and once the rank raises, it cannot be lowered. Meanwhile, Hansu takes the weapon from the werewolf, noticing that his level has not risen at all, and God does not give any specifics, so he decides to move on before bumping into the pack again. Hansu decided to attack, and the gods started to pray for his soul. However, Hansu assured them that he wouldn't die. Then, Hansu tied a vine to a stone and swung it in the air. The werewolves had just noticed his presence by this time, while Hansu was about to show the monsters what centrifugal force is. In fact, if he just avoided death, then the blessing would take care of everything else. He managed to deal with all the wolves except for one, and he asked him about where the village is. The werewolf showed him the way, and then asked him to spare him. But after all, Hansu promised that he would just hurt him less, and not spare him. Meanwhile, in the temple, they arranged for a rest, telling the high school students that their training would begin the next day. Alsus would teach swordsmanship, and Athena would teach magic. Oh Han Wu immediately asked if it was possible not to study at all because he was too self-confident. Some immature god pays attention to him. The next morning, everyone was already lined up, waiting for Princess Athena. At the same time, Oh Han Wu received the blessing special, which meant, you are the most special hero in the whole world, and only you can feel this blessing well. Thinking himself special, Oh Han Wu left the temple and went to the city square of the prologue. He immediately went to the Guild of Mercenaries, where he decided to sign up immediately, as it is done in many games of this genre. Then, a red-haired lady approached him, warning that it was very dangerous, and he needed to return home. However, Oh Han Wu thought that this mercenary was some kind of princess in disguise. That's why he decided to catch her, inviting her to his team. The immature main god is dying of laughter. After successfully handling another group of werewolves, Han Su learns that the village is located towards the west. Despite his god's apathy towards his actions, Han Su faces another werewolf and defeats it. During this confrontation, he overhears human voices and soon realizes that they are speaking in an unfamiliar language. The humans notice him, and without comprehending their language, Han Su surrenders by falling to his knees and raising his hands above his head. As they set off together, and Han Su managed to explain his name to them with gestures, but he can't understand anything else from someone else's speech. Despite the fact that it seems that his new acquaintances are friendly to him now, God is not happy with this situation at all because the guy does not behave like an outsider. He also talks to them as if they are close. Han Su just shrugs him off and talks about his own things. He also managed to find out other people's names. The big guy with the beard is called Gary, and he is most likely the leader of this group. He also carries a huge sword behind his back. The young man's name is Cole. He laughs quite often, and is also a two-handed man who owns two swords. Misa is the girl who wanted to shoot him with a crossbow. She is pointing somewhere in the distant smoke, and if it's not from a fire, then it's from someone's houses. God again notices that he is not behaving like an outsider. Then suddenly, werewolves appear from behind who clearly intend to tear up the entire team. Hansu was about to attack, however. He was outpaced by Cole and Gary, who rushed to the attack. Bad or good, everyone starts to protect him, and even he managed to save Misa from strong jaws during one of the attacks. It seemed that an easy victory was at hand, but for some reason, the group is not particularly happy about it. Despite the protection provided to her, the girl directs her crossbow directly into Hansu's chest and shoots where the heart is. 
the world disappears before his eyes. The men and the girl are talking about how they considered the kid dangerous, especially when he took out a dagger, but now he can't even be sold into slavery, so they'll just have to sell everything he has. Misa reports that she did not hit the heart, so Cole needs to be more careful. Cole raises one of his swords, ready to deliver the last blow, but abruptly freezes when Hansu's status window pops up in front of him. There are only two reasons for this phenomenon. Either Hansu shared it himself, or he has a special blessing. It is logical that, under such circumstances, the target should be alive. Hansu rises with a sharp movement and stabs the swordsman's neck in the same way he eliminates Gary. However, he is shot again by Misa, but that doesn't stop him as he eliminates Misa despite her begging for forgiveness. Then he takes off her uniform and puts it on himself while God laughs and says that he respects Hansu's weird hobby, to which he replies that it's not a hobby. It was just the only armor that suited him. Afterwards, he manages to see Misa's status window. She also had a blessing, but the girl was not a hero. Apparently this was a very common phenomenon. Hansu decides to continue on to the village. The good thing is that the dead carried a bag of coins with them. Meanwhile, magic training is taking place in the temple. Athena claims that talent is really important in magic, which is determined by pedigree and acquired academic connections. However, she also says that it is still possible for a person who has neither one nor the other to become a magician. Since Yubora asked this question, the princess decides to make her her first student and asks her to take an oath using magic. Due to the fact that they have made such a connection, Yubora gets a blessing of rank C. If you don't have parents or a teacher with the blessing of magic, then you won't be able to become a wizard. The lesson continues with the princess using ordinary magic, which is called white magic. There is also black magic that she used without a blessing or talent, which burned her hands. If someone wants to achieve it, then they will have to use their body as fuel. Meanwhile, Hansu gets to the village. Fortunately, he manages to reach the tavern by bribing the guard and enters an inn where he takes a shower. As he is taking a shower, he hears someone talking, which he is able to understand judging by his curse. This is a representative of a hostile race. Hansu gets dressed and grabs his dagger, but he decides to open the door and hide the weapon since he wants a meaningful conversation. A man, who appeared ordinary, introduced himself as the village chief. He checked in after hearing that there was someone who didn't understand their language. The man could also see Hansu's status and advised him to hide it, surprising Hansu. The chief thought Hansu was an elf, but was wrong. The village had been invaded by werewolves who lost their home to greedy fairies causing many to lose their families. The village was a fort built by those seeking revenge. A certain god for some reason looks very upset. The man asks his last question, why didn't the paralytic drug affect the boy hearing this? Hansu immediately grabs his dagger pressing the laid to someone else's throat with a sharp movement, but his hand cramps it as useless to resist. Hansu finds himself tied up in an underground basement where the village chief is angry at the elves who are tied up by their legs to the ceiling. He then asks Hansu to look at his status window, in which his name is Crimson, and not only does he have the blessing of madness, but also the curse of elves. The curse says that the village chief has become their enemy, and his lifespan has been shortened. That's why it becomes more difficult to deal with the enemy, especially since he is a black magician, and in order to prolong his life, he needs to sacrifice someone. So he decided to sacrifice Hansu, and promises him to sacrifice him without any pain. Hansu calls out to the village chief, to which he responds with pleasure, rejoicing that Hansu does not start begging for his life. While the village chief is distracted by whipping the still living elves in bags to death, his actions are completely immoral. So, Hansu decides to take him by trickery. He talks about how he understands what it's like to walk down a path that no one can recognize. The village chief is delighted that now he himself apparently has become an outsider which means that he should become the only wolf. Actually, that's right. The lunatic still wants to eliminate him. However, after that for some reason the village chief becomes more supportive of him and chooses some elf whom he throws off with chains on a circle for sacrifices. Apparently, Hansu will stay alive. In order to sacrifice, he needs the consent of the victim, which he receives from the fact that they promise the unfortunate elf that he will let his friend go after the ritual. Hansu realizes that for some reason, the village chief is not getting any younger, to which he receives an answer that the village chief in front of him is not a person at all. 
He says that when he was human, because of the curse, he immediately became sick and old. And if then, a wandering magician who proposed an experiment that makes him half human, half werewolf, a hybrid of those who have a grudge against the blond-eared creatures, and it seems that this is condescension, because the village chief puts his palm on Hansu's shoulder and says that today is the most wonderful day, and he was finally able to know who he is. And then he adds that he uses the life of Hansu properly. Meanwhile in the temple, we are shown the formation of Princess Athena. She was called the genius of the magic kingdom of Archmages, and she herself has always admired hard-working people. Being a princess took up most of her time, but thanks to her talent, she didn't have to put much effort into it. And despite the fact that Yu Bora heard explanations about the academic connection and pedigree, she still wanted to learn the whole skill on her own. That's why the princess chose her as her first student. Later, she explains to Yu Bora that if she wants to strengthen her magic, then she should imitate the magic of her teacher. Thanks to the patronage, the royal family inherited some of the talents of their ancestors. It is because of this that they have been able to use outstanding flame magic for many generations. However, she can also use ice magic and create something out of ice on her own. Then, Zhang Mi Yan raises the question of how to use magic for those who do not have a blessing. A real hum arises during which the princess asks who will become her second student. Naturally, everyone is torn, which is why a more or less friendly class becomes enemies who will fight for a place. After that, she continues the lesson saying that you can acquire your own magic through training and practice. Yu Bo Ra asks if white magic and black magic are similar, to which the princess warns her, saying that black magic requires sacrifices during each use, and it is impossible to master it. Meanwhile, in the village, Han Su sits in the sacrificial circle before the village chief asks for his consent. We need to act quickly, otherwise life will really end here, he says. Hansu asks the village chief about his last wish to see Misa for the last time. Hansu lies that he is the boyfriend of Misa, the girl he eliminated earlier, but the village chief doesn't really believe him because he knows that Misa's boyfriend is Cole. Fortunately, Hansu again manages to get out by saying that he is her ex. And if the village chief still does not believe him, then let him sniff. And really, he smells like Misa, so he's not lying. Does he have any other desires? Hansu asks him to let him go free if he can survive the ritual, and it would seem that they made a deal. But the village chief is so evil that he takes it as consent, which means that he can start the sacrifice. During the ritual, Hansu's entire body hurts, but due to his outsider's blessing, he manages to break free from the ropes and strike the village chief in the face. The village chief is shocked that Hansu not only managed to deceive him, but also survived the ritual. The outsider's blessing removed all the effects and even restored his shortened lifespan. But now the village chief has to fulfill his part of the deal. Hansu grabs a dagger and examines the bound elves. He frees the blue-haired elf and throws her over his shoulder, rushing to the door while the village chief is still surprised. However, he soon tries to nullify his promise by releasing the lifespan he received from Hansu. He is just about to use his black magic when he abruptly chokes on his own blood and begins to age. What kind of status does this guy have? Who is he, anyway? Hansu pulls out his dagger, shouting that he is an outsider's apostle, while a certain god tells him not to put on airs, and then he himself is embarrassed. Hansu wonders if he eliminates the village chief, who is level 13, he might finally be able to raise his level, but it's better to think about escaping. Just as Hansu turns around, he hears the words about revenge, and the village chief's human body dies, then the werewolf's head comes out, the village chief rushes at him, inflicting, as it seemed to him, a fatal blow to Hansu's chest and heart area. However, Hansu recovers quickly with the help of his outsider's blessing, and manages to slay him with the help of the blue-haired girl who grabs the village chief's leg and blocks his way with her shackles. Before his death, the werewolf only plaintively apologizes to his daughter for not being able to take revenge. Afterwards, Hansu releases all the prisoners, even calls the guards, and it seems that everything is over until soon. The elves are still not positive towards him, and fire at him as he runs away. Meanwhile in the temple, new magicians began to appear in the temple who wanted to receive the title of mentor for the hero they train. When Princess Athena talked about how to create a fireball and was asked again if mathematical formulas were needed, she refused. However, other archmages who pulled up refuted her answer, 
saying that it is important to know all sorts of factors that can somehow affect the outcome of events and magic itself. Meanwhile, we are shown a village where Esopresso, the servant of the elf princess, is being treated. She and everyone else also escape from the village chief's grasp after being rescued. Her friend comes to her and says that they have lost track of the boy. It turns out that they attacked him because of a dagger with a royal emblem, which makes the maid very angry. She even calls all people ordinary animals. The blue-haired elf whom Han Su saved comes into the room. Her name is Celebless. She is a councilwoman, and she also possesses the royal blood flow because of her eternal life. She became the elder's toy and stayed in the basement the longest. On the contrary, she is even grateful to the person for saving them. However, the maid still does not trust Han Su and says that he might be after her eternal life. But Celebless informs her that if Han Su used a breach of contact, if it is terminated, everyone should pay the same price. However, the village chief underestimated the life force of Han Su and self-destructed, saying he does not need her eternal life force, and leaves the room, saying she'll find him. As she left, it is shown that a certain god was spying and listening to everything, and immediately returns to Han Su and asks if he's alive, which he is. However, he's stuck in the foliage of a tree. Meanwhile, Prince Alsus leads the students who want to learn swordsmanship to the banquet hall, where there is a huge table with drinks and treats. However, he is not very happy with the fact that the guys think of swordsmanship only as some kind of ignorant fight. So he asks the captain of the knights to arrange a sparring that takes place between him and Alsus. The first match resulted in Alsus's defeat as he was holding back. Then, after being treated, he asks the knight commander to use all his might, as he will show what true swordsmanship is. Then both of them fill their swords with mana, and face off in a duel in which the knight commander's sword simply breaks in half, resulting in Alsus's victory. Then Alsus tells the students that the power to cut through the opponent in one strike is swordsmanship. Meanwhile, Han Su was slaying more werewolves. He noticed that it had become easier to defeat them, and his body seemed to have become more nimble than before. He thought that his level might have gone up, but it didn't. He was still level one. Then, he offered to negotiate with the surviving werewolf. That if he tells him how the werewolves use their swordsmanship like the village chief, Han Su would give him elven meat. The werewolf agreed, and answered that they ate lots of meat to gain power. However, Han Su didn't understand the power of meat so he decided to explore the werewolves' ecosystem for his smooth revenge. Meanwhile, as Alsa stood at the head of the table, he explained that while talent is necessary for magic, anyone can learn swordsmanship if they have the time and money. The students sitting at the table did their best to pay attention. Some listened to Alsa, while others argued. Alsa continued to explain but was interrupted by Choi, who loudly placed his empty cup on the table, demanding another drink. Alsus advised him to stop drinking as excessive alcohol consumption reduces efficiency. Choi is annoyed as he wanted to become stronger and faster and thought himself to be different from the others. Suddenly, a butler appeared behind his chair and offered him honey tea to clear his mouth and help him feel better. Alsus told him about the importance of consistency and suggested he have one cup a day, or perhaps two if he was greedy. Choi nervously picks up the teacup and declared that he would drink two cups a day. Then Alsus explained that the blessing of a warrior cannot be achieved in a short period, just like a child can't turn into an adult overnight. However, if they maintain their determination, they would be able to achieve their goal in less than a year. Choi was shocked to learn that it would take so long. Then suddenly, he received a system notification stating that he had received a new blessing, Grit F, which would make him stronger and mightier the longer he fought. The effect would be reset as soon as he was defeated, or his will to fight was broken. At that moment, a certain god of war proudly remarked that it was unimaginable, while another god of martial arts just snorted. Alsus congratulated Choi for receiving the god of war's recognition and continued to teach about how to hide the status window. Meanwhile, Hansu followed the werewolf for a couple of days to observe the power of the meat. The werewolf kept attacking him whenever it got the chance. However, Hansu easily defeated it and asks the werewolf why he's so weak despite being level 6. To this it replied he is not weak, it's Hansu who is abnormal. Annoyed, Hansu hit the werewolf and told it to show him the way. As the werewolf guided him to the village while eating meat, Hansu learned a lot from them. He discovered the location of the fairy's village, who had previously ambushed him, and confirmed the village chief's story about the past. He also learned that every time werewolves consumed meat, 
their strength slowly rose from their stomachs, causing changes in their bodies. This method was much easier than the village chief's black magic. Suddenly, the werewolf went berserk and attacked Hansu. However, by that point, Hansu had already learned everything from the werewolf, including the power of the meat. He then thanked the werewolf and easily slays it using this newfound power. A certain god is surprised to see the changes in Hansu and says that it's the power of meat. Hansu is also surprised by this new power. However, he understands that if he hadn't had the outsider blessing outsider, he would have died, as the new power uses life force, and the outsider blessing creates a loop that resets from the beginning when his strength is depleted. But he thinks it's cool. Afterward, he kept on wandering and defeats many werewolves on the way, eventually reaching the fairy village. He was planning to tunnel through the back, but decided not to, as the security was too tight. Then the certain god kept on kicking him, and told him that now was the right time to go. Hansu follows the instructions and jumps through the wall using his dagger. Then, he assassinates some guards but doesn't feel anything. He understands that these people probably have families to mourn their deaths, just like he has a family, and he almost died without ever seeing them again because of these guys. Hansu is becoming colder. A certain god doesn't like the development. After slaying some more, Hansu is confused because he only sees mercenaries and not a single fairy. While he's thinking, he hears people talking and sees humans moving captives who have bags on their heads. Meanwhile, Esopresso was sleeping, but she was also caught and taken to the basement where they were held captive. Then she hears the voice of the healer who had healed her earlier. It seems that the villagers want revenge for Crimson, the village chief's death, and they think that if they let the fairies leave, they'll take their home and family again. Then they begin to slaughter the fairies, starting with Esopresso. All fairies dies except one, Celebliss. They couldn't decide whether to end her life or not, as she is high in the hierarchy, and they'll face consequences if they were to do so. Celebliss also understands their reasons. However, planning to murder Hansu, who is her savior, is unforgivable. They offer to let her go if she keeps what happened here a secret. However, she refuses. The guy raises his sword. She closes her eyes, thinking it's her end. But suddenly she hears the commotion and opens her eyes and sees Hansu. Hansu recognized her, but first he dealt with the remaining villagers. He noticed the healer running and swiftly threw his dagger, causing her demise. Celebliss called out to Hansu, but he didn't understand her. She then showed him her stats, which surprised him as he had only one blessing while she had three high-ranking blessings, especially the Tamar A. Nonetheless, he didn't understand her motives for showing her stats, but he was able to learn her name and called out to her, to which she nodded and smiled. However, a certain god felt uncomfortable and urged Hansu to remain an outsider. Despite the potential punishment, Hansu decided to help Celebliss, as she had an experience similar to his. As she tries to stand, she stumbled and was about to fall, but Hansu caught her. As they are escaping the village, Hansu noticed that it was too quiet and asked God what could be the reason. However, a certain god was not in the mood to talk to him. So he decided to get rid of the fairy to ease God's anger. But he couldn't trust the villagers, and the forest was full of werewolves. So he left the village sprinting while carrying the fairy. Suddenly she pointed up and said something. Upon looking up, Hansu saw a phoenix. The phoenix landed in front of him, and then Celebliss told him to put her down, which he did, thinking she wanted him to leave her behind while he ran. However, that wasn't the case. Instead, she approached the phoenix and tamed it using her blessing. Then she said something to Hansu and kissed him, shocking a certain god. Hansu was about to ask her motive, but she jumped on the phoenix, said something to him, and left riding it. A certain god didn't like the scenario and brought down divine judgment on the sinner by pulling his hair out. Hansu says that he's upset as well, because it was his first kiss. Suddenly his stats open up, and he receives a new blessing, Fairy C, which increases his lifespan and youth. Additionally, all the effects and favorable comments he receives from the fairy are drastically amplified. Hansu quickly understands that the blessing fairy and outsider are similar, but if he were to use both of them together, he can burn a tremendous amount of lifespan and increase his meat power. However, the certain god was not happy with this development, so Hansu says that he's happier now that he has parted ways with the fairy, which makes the god happy again. Meanwhile, Prince Alsus brings the students outside and explains that today, 
they will increase their levels by hunting monsters. And for their first hunt, the knights will draw the monster here. Princess Athena explains that for mages, blessings are absolutely necessary, and leveling up also increases the blessings rank. The students are excited about this fantasy-style hunting. One of them notices a slime and rushes to attack it, but is stopped by Alsus and Athena. They explain slime is a beneficial and harmless creature, as they eat all kind of filth, trash, pest, and corpse. Then Alsus explains that today they will hunt level 4 werewolves. Some students show concern as they are only level 1, but Princess Athena assures them that even if they were to die, the Saintess will revive them. And the hunting begins. The students rush to attack, but the werewolves easily defeat them and injure the student's eye. Then one by one, all the students get defeated. The black-haired girl tries to use magic, but she couldn't, and also meets her demise. At that moment, Alsus steps in and eradicates all the werewolves. Some students are badly injured, while others have died. Then, the saintess appears and uses her power to revive them from the dead. She wants the heroes to fight with every last breath they have, and every time they die, she'll revive them. Choi manages to defeat a werewolf and reaches level 2, thanks to his new blessings. One is acceleration, which helps him move swiftly in critical situations, and the longer it's used, the longer the cooldown. The other command, which enhances the abilities of any group he leads. Mian also reaches level 2 using her blessing Charm, which she uses to charm other guys into doing tasks for her. Because of that, some girls look at her with annoyance. She also receives a new blessing called Color of Beauty, which frees her from ungraceful acts and psychological phenomena and ensures her physical maintenance is perfect for her. Upon seeing the boys having fun defeating monsters, Choi's teammates switch teams and join Mion's team. Choi then teams up with the other girls who were on bad terms with Mion, all while the gods watch their interactions. On the other hand, Eubora tries to hunt alone and is attacked by a werewolf. Even the gods pity her for being alone. However, she uses her magic to defeat the werewolf and also reaches level 2. She then receives the blessing Martial God, which turns her body into a powerful weapon in all situations, and any weapon she possesses will be restored. While she's distracted, a werewolf attacks her. She quickly uses her new blessing and defeats it, reaching level 3 in the process. After slaying thousands of werewolves, Hansu checked his stats over and over while fighting and even received a curse, Slaughterer E. But he finally realized that he couldn't level up. For some reason, a certain god felt uneasy about this. He thinks that he can't level up because of Goddess's curse. A certain god was acting suspiciously and trying his best to avoid Hansu. He then checks the curse he received earlier, Slaughterer E. This makes friendly races slightly fear him and find him appealing, and increasing the chances of them opposing his cruel actions, which makes him a complete outsider. But a certain god is happy with that. As Hansu is checking the loot he received from the monsters, the werewolves called out from behind intending to take revenge. Among them was a level 9 werewolf. They rush to attack him and tear him apart, but he easily defeat them. Afterward, he looted every single werewolf and collected a bag full of gold coins. But he couldn't sell them, as he didn't understand human language. While he was thinking about where he could find a translator, a human-looking person called out to him, understanding his language. Hansu rushed to the guy and grabbed him by his collar, asking who he was. The guy replied that he was a demon. Hansu was a bit confused because he thought demons were very powerful, and that's why the goddess summoned them. But this guy looked weak. Upon hearing this, the guy burst into tears and said that he wasn't weak. Instead, Hansu was abnormally strong despite being level 1, which the guy learned using his blessing to check Hansu's stats. The guy also mentioned that he is a dark mage and currently looking for a marriage partner. A certain god urges him to ask the demon more about his personal story. He did so by simultaneously shaking him, which annoyed the demon. The demon then tells him that the stronger a demon is, the more partners they can have. But he is weak, so he ran away as he didn't want to become the 243rd husband of an old demon. Hansu shows his pity, which annoys the demon again. He then asks Hansu how he's moving, as he used a lot of paralysis potions, which pissed him off as he had a similar experience with the village chief. The demon then tries magic to bind him but he easily breaks free and asks about his relation with the village chief, to which the guy replies that he helped the village chief when he was on the verge of dying, as his backstory was heart-touching. This makes Hansu angry, 
as he didn't have a pleasant encounter with the village chief. Meanwhile, the Saintus informs the group that the other students have given up, and the remaining funds will be allocated to the remaining students. Suddenly, a knight arrives with news of a level 5 werewolf sighting. Considering that some of the heroes have attained level 5, the Saintus seizes the opportunity, believing it will offer valuable experience. The students prepare for an attack, but as they approach the werewolf, it swiftly closes the distance, launching a fierce assault. While everyone is injured, Yubora attacks it using her flame magic, but she is also defeated and thrown at Miyan. Miyan uses her blessing charm to buy some time. Then Alsis came to the rescue and swiftly slays the werewolf, saving them. However, today's event left Miyan traumatized. After badly beating the demon, Hansu tells him to take him to the city or he'll beat him again. After healing himself, the demon refuses to take him to the city, as there is a very powerful saint there. However, he offers to take Hansu to the city next to it. Hansu agrees because he also doesn't want to be in the city where the goddess Saintess resides. As they head for the city, the demon informs Hansu that the city entrance is restricted by knights, so they will have to go through identity checks. However, it will be difficult for him as he is a demon. Hansu is pissed off as he had a hard time due to the language barrier and curses the goddess, while a certain god is having fun. In the meantime, the pink-haired girl is angry with Oh Hanwu for his lack of knowledge about the world, yet aspiring to become a mercenary. Despite her anger, she has paid for his armor, weapon, and the inn in the past two days, leading him to believe it's due to his blessing, special. She tells him to be careful as they are in the territory of orcs who are stronger than werewolves. Oh Hanwu confidently agrees, while the immature god and the wind god pay attention to him. He is slime rank, which is the lowest rank among mercenaries, but this grants him the mercenary blessing, which rewards him with extra experience points upon quest completion. Failing or giving up would result in a significant loss of experience points. Their quest requires collecting werewolf ears, but they haven't found any werewolves. The girl suggests going to the guild for information, but Oh Han Wu refuses. Suddenly a werewolf attacks him from behind, but he manages to dodge. Then two more werewolves appear from behind and throw rocks at Ohanwu, knocking him unconscious. Upon waking up, the girl informs him that she took care of the werewolves but lost an arm in the process. Feeling responsible, Ohanwu checks his stats hoping his blessing can heal her arm. She reassures him that it wasn't his fault. Misinterpreting her forgiveness as an effect of his blessing, Ohanwu gets angry at the gods who find it amusing. In response, they curse him preventing him from peeking at things and increasing the chances of his secrets and weaknesses being revealed. That shatters his dream of traveling with beautiful girls. The girl advises that they leave the forest as it feels ominous. Ohanwu decides to seek help from the saints in the city, promising to fix her arm. Oh, meanwhile, the demon introduced himself as Cogmos, the 23rd child of the 348th wife of the 14th demon king. He preferred to go by his nickname Mos, given to him by his girlfriend who became the 425th wife of the 7th Demon King. Although Hansu felt sympathy for Cogmos's backstory, he didn't think Cogmos had it as hard as him. He then informed Hansu that they would be able to leave the forest soon and warned him not to let his guard down as they would be passing through orc territory. Cogmos then spotted many orcs, and they were also able to spot him due to Hansu's glowing red eyes. Although he could hide his eyes, he preferred not to as they provided him with clear night vision, which he used to assess the orcs' numbers. He then approached the orcs in hopes of conversing with them, but was disappointed to find they were not intelligent. He took out his dagger and easily defeated them, while Cogmos lay on the ground with his legs burning with white flames. He told Hansu to look up, and as he did, he noticed a big white dragon. Cogmos informed him that a saintess was riding the dragon and had attacked him from a distance. Although injuries like this meant little to a demon, injuries inflicted by a saintess took longer to heal. He then asked Hansu to carry him, and although Hansu initially declined, he eventually agreed. As he is walking, Hansu told Cogmos that he had almost become a hero, which shocked him. Although Cogmos had seen the curse hero, he didn't think much of it, as these curses were given to demons when they lost to a hero. The curse made it difficult to level up making it impossible to take revenge. Cogmos was confused about how Hansu could have gotten this strong despite having a blessing like Outsider, which was more like a curse than a blessing as it reset everything including his stats. A certain god let out a sigh and reminisced about the past. In the temple the students are frustrated as they keep losing. 
Then, a knight came and informed Prince Alsus that all the werewolves are annihilated by an unknown culprit, and after analyzing the scene, they discovered that only one person had done it. Just as he was about to say something, Ohanwu arrived with a pink-haired girl demanding to meet the saintess. Princess Athena recognized the girl and asked what happened, and as they are conversing. The saintess arrived, disappointed that Ohanwu was still level one. She checked the girl's stats in which her name is Arya, and she had a blessing called Nobility B, indicating that she might be a duke's daughter. However, that wasn't enough for the saintess to heal her hand. Ohanwu argued that Arya had protected him with her life, but the saintess pointed out that the knights had done the same. So what made her an exception? He then attempted to use his blessing special, but the saintess easily nullified it. She told him that she received many valuable treasures for her healing abilities, while he couldn't give her anything, and tells him to return after becoming stronger. Eubora raised her hand and asked if she could take Arya as her comrade, and the saintess agreed as she had potential. She then healed Arya's hand, and Arya thanked Eubora, while Ohanwu was left alone. He was approached by Princess Athena, who thanked him for bringing her childhood friend Arya into the temple, and chose him as her second disciple, resulting in him receiving the blessing magic, and makes him believe that she had a crush on him. He then decided to continue his journey. After defeating many orcs, Hansu takes their sheep and ties Cogmos with them, as he can't always carry him. After a complete recovery, he asks Hansu to untie him, which he does, and asks him how he's hiding his horn to which he replies that he used a magic spell to hide it. They then notice a carriage being attacked by a group of orcs, but instead of helping them, he decides to watch for now, as he still can't trust humans in this world. The carriage is surrounded by orcs, and two girls come out of it. One of them uses fire magic, while the other uses swordsmanship to attack the orcs. Hansu decides to help them, as they look like elites of this world, and getting on good terms with people like them would make his life easier. So, he uses his curse to call out many orcs, but it won't affect humans as they won't understand him. Although a certain god advises him to let them die, he persists in saving them. The orcs notice him beside them and quickly attack, but he easily dodges their attacks and defeats one of them. As he dodges the other orcs' attacks, a red orc rushes to attack him but is easily defeated. The soldier thanks Hansu for saving them, and he is able to understand it because he has been learning the human language from Cogmos. A certain god feels uncomfortable with his outsider actions and proposes him to let everyone die. He ignores that and continues to attack the orcs. After defeating all of them, Cogmos informs him that everyone is shocked by his actions. Hansu then asks him to do something about it, so Cogmos introduces himself as a mage and Hansu as a swordsman from a different continent, so they don't suspect his language issue. One of the girls points out Hansu's curse, Hero, which Cogmos assures her that he's not a demon and that he also has the blessing Fairy Sea, an amazing symbol of trust, considering that even humans who marry a fairy are E-rank at best. The girl then apologizes to Hansu, which makes him happy as he managed to secure a good translator and finally gains people's trust. But a certain god feels uncomfortable and dislikes the development. He then tells the god to calm down and shares his secret of being impotent. The god cheers him up, but it's his fault to begin with, as the outsider blessing makes all stats return to normal including that. As Hansu is enjoying the campfire, he is approached by one of the girls from earlier. Her name is Julia. She's a noble lady who attended a prestigious fantasy academy. He's in a bit of a pickle, as he doesn't fully understand the language, meaning he can't understand her. She then shows her abilities and says something to him, which he takes as her asking him to show his abilities, which he does. After seeing this, the girl rushes to him and holds his arm while saying something, but he doesn't understand. Then she backs away and apologizes. Thinking that the aura he had shown is small, he tries with a dagger, but the girl has already left running. Pissed off, he says it's hard to understand a woman's heart, while the god says that an impotent person doesn't need to know. Meanwhile, Ohanwu is restricted from entering the temple. He's a failed hero who left the temple, resulting in him losing all the funds. The priest then offers him three choices, accepting individual funds, and giving up the hero title, which, if he were to use, he'll receive the death penalty. Returning to training without receiving funds until visible results are seen, or entrusting himself to the temple, which takes care of his life, marriage, and retirement, but he can't exit the temple until death. Ohanwu chooses the first option, signs a contract, and receives funds. He then heads to the slave market, 
while a childish god king munches on popcorn. The saintess receives the news of Ohanwu's decision. She thinks they'll lose more heroes in the future, and even if they don't lose more, it'll still be troublesome as there is another saintess on the continent. If a battle were to emerge, she would have to deal with it herself. She then inquires about the news of the werewolves being annihilated, and after hearing the full report, the saintess thinks that it wasn't done by some knight or a wandering swordsman, but by someone else who is far stronger. The other girl then mistakenly mentions the demon king and quickly apologizes. But the saintess also agrees and tells her to investigate and find out if the demon king is involved. As she was thinking of the possibility of the demon king, the priest informs her that the information about the hero summoning is leaked. As an academy student saw Oh Han Wu's stats, the academy invites the hero for vacation. Although she is disappointed in the current situation, she can't do anything about it. Then suddenly, a knight comes and informs about the discovery of a bag that belongs to a hero. Meanwhile, as Hansu and Cogmos are discussing about mercenaries, he informs Hansu that if one becomes a mercenary, they receive a blessing that gives experience points for completing quests. Hearing this, Hansu checks his stats to see that the hero curse that doesn't allow him to receive experience points only applies to those from hunting and achievements. That means experience points gained by other means are unaffected. He then asks Cogmos how to become a mercenary. They finally arrive in the city, but Hansu is not happy about the rotten stench at the entrance. Cogmos informs him that all types of people, including mercenaries, gather around the entrance, so it's natural. But Hansu is one to talk, as he smells like he bathed in orc blood. The two girls says that they want to repay Hansu for saving their lives, and suggest that he books the same inn as them. He agrees, but a certain god isn't happy about it. Then Cogmos suggests that he should wash up first if he doesn't want to get chased out of the mercenary guild. After arriving at the inn, Hansu is fascinated by the slimes cleaning his clothes. Cogmos then warns him not to steal one, as educated slimes are very expensive and worth their weight in gold. After changing clothes, Hansu and Cogmos come downstairs and wait for the girls. When the girls arrive, Cogmos invites them for lunch, but the girls want to follow Hansu, which annoys him. Hansu is happy that he was able to meet good people in this fantasy world, but a certain god is not happy about that. Oh Han Wu arrives at the slave market and meets his former classmate, who is also buying a slave. His classmate suggests that Oh Han Wu let the slave merchant check his status, as it may lead to a discount if the merchant finds out he's a hero. Oh Han Wu is skeptical, but the guy informs him that the temple won't do anything, as they can't stop someone from checking their status. He then allows the slave merchant to check his status, and the merchant quickly recognizes him and asks what type of slave he wants. Oh Han Wu says that he wants a strong female slave. The merchant shows him a level 17 female slave, but she's not to his liking, so he asks for a strong yet slender female slave. The merchant lets Oh Han Wu choose his slave, and he chooses three female slaves. He signs a contract with them, and after paying the full price, he orders them to follow him to buy some weapons. Meanwhile, Hansu is having difficulty filling out the mercenary registration page as he doesn't understand the language and words. Cogmos then incorrectly writes his name on the paper, which he copies and signs for the registration, while Cogmos is dying of laughter. Upon completing the registration, Hansu receives the blessing Mercenary D because of the girls vouching for his skills. The girls then hand him a quest in which he has to defeat some orcs and bring back their noses. Hansu agrees as he plans to use the girls as bait while the god asks if there will be another slaughter, to which he replies, Of course not. This time will be an annihilation. As the quest began, Julia tried to defeat an orc but was counterattacked. Then the other girl, Laisha, used fire magic to save her and told her not to push herself. However, they couldn't help it as Hansu easily slaying many orcs while they couldn't defeat a single one. So they tried to help, but quickly became exhausted, and asked Hansu to take a little break. They were surprised by his stamina as he kept on defeating orcs without breaking a sweat. While the two girls were talking about how amazing Hansu is, Julia mentioned that Hansu is using an unstable swordsmanship technique that could potentially destroy his entire body if he were to make any mistakes. He then took out a book and started learning language. But for some reason, all the words he was saying were either menacing or begging for life. Julia informed Laisha that she is now level 15 and that she would aim for B rank as it would be difficult for them alone, but they have Hansu's help. Upon hearing this, Leisha teased Julia, 
suspecting that she had fallen in love with Hansu. After learning a little bit, Hansu called out to the girls to continue their hunt. Meanwhile, in the temple, the knight showed Saint the bag that they found in the werewolf's forest. She then asked the knight if Prince Alsus knows about this, to which he replied that he doesn't. She then threatened the knight that if he were to leak the information, he would receive death penalty. She noticed a badge that had a name written on it, and called her subordinate to learn letters from the heroes and identify the belongings. As the existence of the bag was clearly a mistake of the goddess who was known to be perfect, she decided to cover it up. Her subordinate then informed her about the situation in the fairy village, and after interrogating the villagers, they learned that the person who helped the fairies called himself Outsider. Confused by this, she ordered her subordinate to get a sketch of what the Outsider looked like. At the same time, Hansu was learning language from picture books while everyone else was sleeping. A certain god is fascinated by cute picture books. Then Hansu asked where all the other gods were so he could avoid them, to which the god pointed in a direction. Hansu quickly figured out that in that direction might be the saintess that Cogmos mentioned, so he decided to run in the opposite direction until he became strong. God then told him to change the page, which he declined as he hadn't memorized that part yet. God then put pressure on him, making him agree, but Hansu said that it was not the right time as they were surrounded. He then woke up Cogmos and the other girls then informs them that they were surrounded. Then all the men came out, and their leader told Hansu to hand over his spoils and leave the girls behind. Hansu was pissed as people kept trying to harm him. He then used his curse to summon orcs and rushed at the leader of the group, easily defeating him while others fought with orcs. Suddenly, he was attacked from behind by the leader, but he quickly healed himself with his blessing outsider and finishes him while others dealt with the remaining people. Afterward, they arrived at the mercenary guild and handed over the orc's nose to the receptionist. He then shares the proof of quest completion with the girls. They thanked Hansu as with his help they were able to level up. Seeing that even mediocre demon Cogmos had leveled up, Hansu checked his stats, only to find out that he was still level one. He then turned to God while she tried her best to avoid him. Long ago, living beings discovered an entity that they now called God. They sought the help of God, and through that assistance, gods felt the meaning and joy of existence. However, the number of gods slowly increased, and each had their own way of helping. As if they were competing with each other, living beings who received blessings from gods grew in different ways, while those who were unable to acknowledge each other fell into conflict and died in vain. A certain god noticed a blond-haired boy who was dying and asked if he wanted to live. Tearfully, the boy asked to be saved and God helped him by turning him into a child and giving him to his parents, who happily accepted the boy. God was proud of their result. After a long time passed, God visited the blond-haired boy and asked how he was doing. The boy, who had lost the woman he loved because he had turned into a child, cursed at the God. The God pointed out that the boy never mentioned any women when he wished to be saved and apologized, but the boy angrily lashed out at God, causing her to run away. She couldn't figure out what she had done wrong. Meanwhile, other gods blessed countless lives, but they all resented the outsider god, though she couldn't understand why. As time passed, more and more living beings viewed god as a tool. So all the gods made new rules and adapted to the new order, except for one god. God noticed a man dying. The man's name was Cain, and he was level 38 with many high-ranking blessings. But he was going to die. Then, a certain god asked if he wanted to live. The man quickly said yes, but God warned him that he would lose everything in the process. The guy accepts it as it's better than dying. God was overjoyed to realize that she was still needed in this world and healed the guy. But in the process, he lost his level and was now level one. Despite this setback, he did not lose hope knowing that he could always start anew. However, sometime later, he was kicked out of his own team for being level one. Although he was angry, he still didn't feel anything, and advised God to never bless anyone again, as it was a curse that took away something more valuable than life. And he himself would never use this blessing again, even if he were to die. This revelation shocked God, and she finally acknowledged that she was no longer needed in this world. After a long time, God found another dying boy. Now, in the present day God is worried that Hansu might come to resent her. Hansu was mad but not at God, 
but himself for not realizing it sooner and wasting his time slaughtering orcs. God then asked if Hansu was angry, to which he replied that he wasn't and decided to buy picture books for God. Hearing this, a certain God desperately prays, and Hansu asked if it was for his dead soul. God quickly denied it and said it was a secret. Meanwhile, as Oh Hanwu opens his eyes, he finds himself lying on the ground while his slaves are being taken. Moments ago, Oh Hanwu was commanding his team to defeat werewolves, and they managed to do so, following his commands. However, it wasn't enough to defeat the werewolf as it stood up and was about to attack them. Then, Oh Hanwu uses fire magic to defeat the werewolf while admiring the blessing magic he received from Princess Athena. His classmate Park Hanyoung, whom he met at the slave market, appears with his slave and praises Oh Hanwu. Realizing the guy's intention to bully him as he did to other students in the past, Oh Hanwu prepares himself to fight. As the fight begins, Park Han Young's slave rushes towards them and easily defeats Oh Hanwu's slave. He then tells Oh Hanwu to hand over his slaves. Meanwhile, Hansu was looking for information on any powerful weapons. Then Cogmos informed him that all the weapons like that had already been confiscated, and those that weren't confiscated are being guarded by the nation's guard. Upon hearing this, Hansu went outside for some fresh air. He was devastated because he couldn't level up, and there were no weapons that could make him strong. While the god cheered him up, an orc called out to him from behind, demanding that he hand over everything he had. Pissed off with his current situation, Hansu attacked the orc and kept on punching him while asking why there weren't any relics. The orc crying, begged him to stop and informed him that there are relics in the orc sanctuary. With this sudden turn of events, Hansu told the orc to show him the way. In the western continent, they ranked things using monsters. High-level knights were ranked as dragons, while the lowest of the low were slime-ranked. Since the orc was in the middle, it meant they were good enough, so it would be easy for him to defeat them. As the orc showed the way, he informed Hansu that even if he showed the way, Hansu wouldn't be able to enter the sanctuary. And when they arrived at the destination, they saw that nothing was there. Then suddenly, a ruined city appeared. The orc was happy, thinking Hansu wasn't able to follow him. But when he turned around, he sees Hansu. Surprised, the orc asked how he could be there since only people below level 1 could enter. Hansu showed the orc his level, and suddenly some orcs shot arrows at him. While the gray-haired orc was about to warn everyone about Hansu's strength, he was easily slain by Hansu, who then rushed towards the other orcs, massacring them. While the god prays for their souls. After slaying thousands of orcs, Hansu uses the slime he bought to take care of the collection while he checks his stats. He discovers that his curse, Massacre, has become rank C, and he receives a new curse called Annihilation D. This curse increases the chances of the people who dies by his hand appearing in his dreams, and the nightmare will continue until all the dead people attain Nirvana. However, it doesn't affect him as he doesn't sleep due to his blessing, Outsider. Additionally, he receives the curse for saving those who were held captive by the orcs. Hansu then asks the surviving orc how to leave this place, since he keeps returning to the same spot, no matter how much he tries to leave. The orc informs him that the exit of the city is in the center. As he was going there, a guardian orc arrives and demands that Hansu answer why he massacred 300,000 orcs. The guardian points his spear at Hansu, stating that he will not let a single person who knows about this place live. Hearing this, Hansu becomes sure that there is treasure, and that is what the guardian is trying to protect. He rushes to attack him, and as their weapons collide, Hansu is pushed back and loses an arm and an eye, but he quickly regenerates using his outsider blessing, much to the orc's surprise. The orc thinks that Hansu is an immortal and plans to lock him up until he gets old and dies. Meanwhile, Yubora receives congratulations from Arya on reaching level 7, which she says is all because of her blessing. Arya also shows her blessing nobility, which means she's a daughter of Duke and can receive XP from family members. However, it's useless as she doesn't have any family members. While they're conversing, the Saintess arrive, which makes Arya a little uncomfortable. She then goes to bring tea, and while drinking the Saintess tells Eubora about her concerns regarding hero rivalries. She mentions that sooner or later, some heroes might be dominated by their blessings, but they won't die because even if they fall, a hero is still a hero. However, their fall will result in the betrayal of the trust of all who believe in heroes. Upon hearing this, Yubora remembers Hansu and wonders if he is doing well. 
The saintess abruptly asks if she knows someone named Kang Hansu and if he is her boyfriend. Shocked, Yubora clarifies that he isn't her boyfriend but merely a classmate. The saintess urges her to tell everything while the gods eavesdrop. Later, the saintess becomes convinced that Yubora is interested in Hansu, as she spends hours talking about him. She also learns about Hansu's desire to go back to Earth, and she's worried that if the heroes find out that Hansu actually didn't go back, their trust will be destroyed. Planning to erase Hansu's existence, she is interrupted by the goddess of heroes, who glances at Hansu's bag and feels uncomfortable indicating that even she can't locate his whereabouts. Saintus then plans to launch a search network without everyone knowing, while the outsider god peeps at the plan and quietly leaves. Meanwhile, Hansu kept on losing to the guardian orc, so he decided to construct a plan and draw the orc's every movement to study and counterattack. While doing so, he was interrupted by Bruce, whom he had saved earlier. Bruce brought a girl with him, and although Hansu couldn't understand their language, he understood Bruce's intention of trying to set him up with a girl. This angered Hansu, so he gave Bruce a beating. He then tells the girl to do whatever she wanted but not to disturb him while he continued drawing. Later in the morning, he showed the outsider god that he had copied the orc's swordsmanship, which bewildered the god. He then received a system notification stating that the outsider blessing rank had upgraded from F to E. While he was thanking the outsider god, another system notification popped up stating that the curse Hero had also upgraded from E to C. This meant that the goddess had noticed that Hansu was still alive, but he decided to ignore it for now and prepared to fight the guardian orc. However, the guardian orc refused to fight him outside and told him to follow him to the training area, which meant that he couldn't leave the sanctuary. As the fight begins, Hansu asks if there is any treasure. The orc responds that there is, but it's reserved for the heroes who graduate from the training ground. Understanding that he can't defeat the goddess with the weapons he finds here, he starts to think of a way. While he's distracted, the orc rushes to attack him, but Hansu easily deflects the strike with the new swordsmanship he learned. This surprises the orc, and he notices that Hansu is trying to get close to the exit. Thinking that Hansu is planning to run away, he rushes towards him to attack. However, Hansu had planned for this scenario and kicks the orc out of the sanctuary. He then starts to look for the treasure with the outsider god guiding him, and he finally finds it, among which are many holy swords. He picks one of them, but the outsider god warns him that he can't wield the sword, as it can only be wielded by heroes, and he has a hero's curse that makes him unable to wield the sword. So he breaks it, as it's only fair that other heroes can't use it either. While breaking the remaining swords, he notices that one of the swords isn't affected by his curse. So he breaks all the holy swords using the unaffected sword to see if it's defective which it isn't. While celebrating his new sword, he receives a new curse called Holy Sword, E. At the same time, Choi completed his hunting for the day and checked his stats. He received numerous blessings and planned to use them in the upcoming tournament to win and obtain the prized Holy Sword. On the other hand, Mion didn't want to fight as she had dreamt of being surrounded by handsome knights. But in reality, she found herself surrounded by average-looking guys. She informed them about the temple's plan to send four highly skilled heroes to the academy and expressed her desire to attend it with them. One guy pointed out that there would be bloodshed within the faction, but he was still willing to join. However, the other guy refused, stating that Mion planned to go out with a prince riding a white horse. Mion assured them that she wouldn't break her promise and said she would grant their wishes if she were to do so. All of them agreed to join her. Meanwhile, Hansu checks the new curse Holy Sword, which made all the holy swords around him stronger by using the Maker's blood and tears. It would be difficult for him to destroy or seal the holy sword. Seeing this, Hansu felt confused, as it was the only holy sword left, and the curse only applied to it which makes it stronger. Later, as he was leaving, the guardian orc appeared. The orc looked older due to leaving the sanctuary. Realizing the orc's weakness, Hansu tried to block its way. However, the orc rushed to attack him, but Hansu easily deflected the blow and cut its arm using the new sword. The orc managed to enter the sanctuary and quickly regenerated and attacked again, but Hansu easily beheaded it. However, it wasn't enough as the orc kept regenerating. So Hansu plans to take its head outside of the sanctuary. But before he could do that, the orc begs him to spare his life, and in return he'll do anything Hansu asks even help him escape this place using the holy sword. Although he can't wield it himself since only heroes can, 
Hansu then takes out the holy sword which shocks the orc and confirms his suspicions about Hansu being a hero. The orc shows Hansu his stats in which he also has the hero's curse and ruin curse that make him unable to leave the ruin. He explains that inside the ruin he is immortal because he is the last strong opponent to test the new heroes, and despite being so strong he lost. He then asks Hansu why he isn't leaving, to which he replies that he'll leave under the condition that he'll let the captives go with him, to which the orc agrees. Hansu then informs everyone that they can go home, but for some reason, only three of them decide to go. As the portal opens, Hansu is a little skeptical as the situation feels familiar, but the god assures him that it's safe. Before leaving he asks the orc how he'll return to the sanctuary, which he replies that they can communicate using the holy sword, so Hansu can command him to open the portal whenever he wants. Upon entering the portal, he finds himself in a woman's room with a holy sword on the wall. He complains to the god, who assures him that it's still safe, but it will be dangerous soon. Then he notices his bag under the table. Meanwhile, the saintess arrived at the place where Celebus was imprisoned and asked the villagers if it was true and if they knew how important Celebus was. She was known as the Guardian of Flame, and despite her weakness in battle, she had the ability to summon incredibly strong monsters, particularly the phoenix. The villager kneels and apologizes while begging her to spare him which she accepts as Celebus herself forgave them. She then asks about the appearance and name of the person who saved the fairy. The villager replies that the man had short black hair like the heroes, but they don't know his name. Upon hearing this, she is certain that it's Hansu, but also confused about how he managed to fight, as even if he has many blessings it would be impossible for him to defeat a werewolf, just like the other students. She wonders which god gave him blessing, as all the gods were with them in the temple. And now that she's certain that the bag belongs to Hansu, she plans to get rid of it, while a certain arrogant god nervously peeks and is displeased. Later, the students arrive in the village where Hansu had been, and Princess Athena tells them not to disturb the villagers, as they had already been through an incident. While the students are fooling around, Choi notices something in the distance, and warns everyone that there might be a werewolf. However, it turns out to be Oh Hanwu who appears injured and filthy. Choi mocks him, and in response, Ohanwu challenges him to a duel, to which he agrees, but just as they are about to start, Arya intervenes, pointing out that Ohanwu is badly injured, and the duel wouldn't be fair. Choi then calls for the saintess who heals Ohanwu and the duel continues. Although he knows that Choi is stronger than him, he is confident in defeating him. A few days ago, after Park Hanyoung took his slave, he received a new blessing, revenge that makes him as strong as his target of revenge. The more people who seek revenge on him, the stronger he becomes. While he wants revenge on Park Hanyoung, he decides not to act on it yet, as he needs a strong target to become even stronger. He chooses Choi as his opponent, since he is the strongest among the students. As the duel begins, Oh Hanwu barely manages to block Choi's sword and uses fire magic to counterattack, which Choi easily dodges. Angered, Oh Hanwu hurls fireballs at Choi, but they have no effect. Just as he is about to deliver the final blow, Ohanwu's blessing special activates, causing a massive explosion that results in a tie in the duel. Meanwhile, Hansu finally arrived at the inn where he was staying and met Cogmos, which surprised him as he didn't run away. Cogmos replied that he wanted to leave but he couldn't, because Prince Alsus, the third strongest knight was present in the kingdom, and wanted to meet Hansu. Cogmos also warned him not to mention anything about him as Alsus was a paladin blessed by the saints and would easily identify Cogmos as a demon. Upon hearing about the saints, Hansu decided to avoid the meeting, stating that he wouldn't go because he couldn't understand their language. Suddenly, Julia and Laisha arrived, who would take him to Prince Alsus and help with communication. Laisha noticed that Hansu had received a new curse, to which he replied that he got it while hunting. Cogmos planned to leave Hansu as staying together for too long would result in him dying without getting married. However, Hansu didn't want to let him go as he needed someone to translate for him. Cogmos then advised him to buy a slave who could translate. Later, after getting dressed up elegantly which he didn't like, Hansu arrived at the palace to meet Prince Alsus. As Prince Alsus introduced himself, Hansu was able to understand him to which the prince replied that it was all thanks to his blessing, language. He then thanked Hansu for subjugating the orcs, who were a major problem for the country, and saving the noble's daughter's life, which Hansu accepted. Curious about Hansu's blessing that annihilated the orcs, 
Prince Alsus requested a duel. But before that, they had dinner, and during the dinner, Alsus praises Hansu for his blessing that allows him to eat as much as he wants, which makes the outsider god happy. Alsus inquires about how Hansu got the hero's curse, to which he lies saying that he gained the curse by beating up a hero who was attacking fairies. He then asks if Hansu remembers the hero's face, to which he lies again, saying that he punched the hero's face so hard that it was unrecognizable. Alsus then reveals the reason he invited Hansu was to investigate, as all the orcs that were in the forest disappeared like magic, almost as if they've gone extinct. Hansu then say that it might be because he hunted too many orcs, to which Alsus replies by emitting an aura and saying that he wanted to subjugate the orcs by himself. However, it didn't affect Hansu, and he replies dumbfoundedly. Fascinated by him, Alsus decides to start the duel. Hansu pulls out the fairy dagger, which shocks Alsus. Then he quickly hides it and shows his swordsmanship aura, which shocks Alsus, as Hansu was able to use such a dangerous aura while he had to injure his hand many times to achieve a lesser version of it. He then gives Hansu a sword and lets him make the first attack, to which Hansu agrees. He heard that Alsus is the third strongest knight in the kingdom, so he used a good amount of force to attack him, causing a huge explosion and a cloud of dust floating everywhere. Thinking that he attacked too hard and that Alsus might be dead, Hansu quickly runs away. But Alsus didn't die, as he used up all of his mana to block Hansu's attack, and is shocked that his sword was easily sliced. He then asked the girls to help him meet Hansu again, and apologize, as he had almost made him feel guilty for his death. The girls accepted and rushed to the inn where Hansu was staying. Meanwhile, the saints arrived at the temple, and noticed that Hansu's bag had been stolen while everything else was fine. Then the goddess appeared speechless with the current situation, and said she should have gotten rid of the bag beforehand. The goddess asked the saintess about her next move, and if there was any way to find the bag. Pissed off with the continuous nagging, she told the goddess to find the bag herself. Upon hearing this, the goddess left. She then received a message from Prince Alsus, who informed her of the current situation regarding the extinction of the orcs. After interrogating the orcs with the language blessing, they learned that it had been done by a demon though it had not been confirmed yet. He also informed her about a hero who had attacked a fairy, and both of them thought that it was Oh Hanwu. Meanwhile, Hansu, who believed that he had murdered Prince Alsus and feared being executed, planned to leave the country. He opened a portal to the sanctuary, and before leaving he told Cogmos to meet him at the city's northern gate. Upon entering the sanctuary through the portal, he met Bruce, who had decided to stay in the sanctuary. Hansu then asked Bruce to help him move stuff, and told the orc not to do anything to the citizens, since they would be helping him. The orc agreed because if he didn't, he would die. Hansu then met up with Cogmos and explained the situation to him. Cogmos advised him that they should head north, where the biggest slave market on the continent was located, and they could buy slaves. However, because Hansu had taken all his things, he wasn't able to buy even a horse to travel. So Hansu decided to carry Cogmos and run, which he didn't like because it was embarrassing. During their journey, Cogmos was starving, so Hansu used his sword to command the orc and opened a portal that provided them with food. After they finished eating, he threw the plates into the portal again, which shocked Cogmos since he had never seen that type of magic before. Hansu replied that it was only him who didn't know about it. Later they arrived in the city, and Cogmos told Hansu that he wouldn't run away so he demanded his stuff back, which he refused, and instead commanded the sword to give him his bag. Realizing that Hansu hadn't learned magic, but was using the sword to summon the portal, Cogmos decided to take a closer look at the sword. As he held the sword to examine it for any spatial spells, he received an electric shock and realized that it was a holy sword that couldn't be wielded by a demon. Upon arriving at the market, Hansu noticed a slave girl being abused by her master. Cogmos then informed him that it was all an act to manipulate weak-minded people into buying slaves, and he commented that the girl's skin was too good for someone being mistreated. They approached the merchant, and inquired about any slaves with the blessing of language. The woman replied affirmatively, and told them to follow her. Hansu asked if the slave would run away, to which Cogmos informed him that they wouldn't, as they had a curse that hurts them every time they go against their master's command. The woman then led them to a female slave named Dialoka, who happened to be a demon. Cogmos instantly developed a crush on her, which prompted teasing from Hansu and the outsider god. He decided to buy her, 
but he didn't have any money. Hansu asked Dialoka how she became a slave, to which she revealed that she had once loved someone, but he doubted her feelings. In order to prove her love, she consented to become his slave, only to be abandoned by him. The outsider god expressed boredom with the story, while Cogmos was moved to tears, seeing that the girl was disgusted. Hansu ultimately purchased Dialoka and checked her stats, discovering that she possessed numerous high-ranking blessings. He then proceeded to buy several more slaves and command them to transport his belongings. However, Cogmos had a change of heart and decided to accompany Hansu. Just as he made this decision, he was shot in the head with an arrow. Another arrow was aimed at Hansu, but he easily deflected it. After beating the attackers, he learned that they were thieves who had heard rumors of a level one human buying slaves, so they decided to steal from him. The guards arrived, and a crowd started to gather, so Hansu decided to escape to the forest with Cogmos. Despite being struck in the head, Cogmos quickly healed due to the demon's high healing abilities. As Dialoka insulted him for his weakness, Hansu turned around to check his shirt and was attacked from behind by Dialoka. However, he easily blocked her attack and destroyed her arm. She then backed away and asked Hansu if he was truly a level one, to which he confirmed and rushed towards her to counterattack. Although he injured her, it was nothing severe for a demon. She then landed a critical hit, and thinking she had won, she demanded that Hansu declare her freedom in return for healing him. However, Hansu declined and healed instantly, which shocked Dialoka. She then healed her hand, and they resumed their fight. But this time her healing ability couldn't keep up with her wounds, and she kept getting beaten one-sidedly. She then took out her wings and put all her power into her leg, launching a powerful attack at Hansu. While Hansu prepared to block it, he caught a glimpse of her panties, causing him to lose focus, and the attack struck his head, knocking him unconscious. When he regained consciousness, the outsider god scolded him for losing focus and told him to cleanse his mind. Dialoka called out to him and requested clothes, as hers had been torn during the fight. Although he refused at first, he eventually agreed and took out clothes from the portal and gave them to her. She was angry, realizing that Hansu had purposely lost the fight, but she acknowledged him as her master, despite her shame as a demon. While Cogmos warned Hansu not to command her anything weird, or he would never forgive him, Dialoka pointed out that he wasn't even strong enough to beat Hansu, so what if he wouldn't forgive him? She then hugged Hansu as a reward, and since she had used up all of her mana, she couldn't move, so she asked him to carry her. Meanwhile, in the temple, the Saintess is troubled by the fact that they can't use monsters to train the heroes, since the werewolves and orcs have gone extinct. She decides to let Alsus handle the matter, while she invites Celebliss to find the intruder who stole the bag, and after hearing about the werewolves incident, Celebliss wonders if Hansu is doing well. She then informs the Saintess that she would use the slime named Malang's help to find the intruder, as it has special abilities. When she commands Malang to find the intruder, it says that the intruder had used a similar holy sword hanging on the wall to open a portal and ran away. The Saintess quickly figures out that it was Hansu. She thanks Celebliss and asks if she needs any help, to which she replies that she needs the Saintess' help to join the academy as a professor. Due to her weakness in battle, she couldn't help during the last incident and even after trying hunting, she realizes that it doesn't suit her. If she joins the academy as a professor and obtains the blessing teacher, she would be able to gain experience points without participating in battles. Understanding her situation, the saintess promises to help her. Meanwhile, Oh Han Wu is happy that he was able to end the duel in a draw despite the gap in his and Choi's levels. He plans to beat him next time while a certain evil god gives him a double thumbs up. Then, the merchant brings the weapons that Oh Hanwu had requested. He then asks if there is any dungeon nearby that no one has conquered yet. The guy replies that there isn't. He then notices a large crowd, and after getting into it, he sees Celebliss, and instantly develops a crush. He approaches her and uses his special blessing and asks her if she has something to say to him. She replies that she doesn't, and his blessing is instantly nullified. He becomes confused as to why his blessing didn't work. Then, a certain male god informs him that there is another owner. So he asks Celebliss if she is married. Upon hearing this, she remembers Hansu again and tells him to back away and leaves. He then overhears the knights talking about a hero's being admitted to the academy and that Celebliss will be a professor at the same academy. Upon hearing this, Ohanwu falls into his delusion of developing a relationship with Celebliss in the academy as a teacher and student. 
so he decides to go back to the temple and become heroes again to get admitted to the academy. Later that night in the temple, Prince Alsus explains to the students about the upcoming tournament in which they have to hunt orcs and collect tags that are attached to their ankles. To prepare for the tournament, they had released a great number of orcs in the forest, which is marked on the map. However, many students are scared, as they have never hunted orcs before. Prince Alsus reassures them that it doesn't matter what method they use to win, as the one who brings the most tags will be the winner and receive the grand prize, a one-of-a-kind hero's sword. Choi is determined to win the tournament to wash away the humiliation he received from Ohanwu. While Choi is thinking about this, Ohanwu appears and declares that he will return to being a hero since his skill level is high enough to participate in the tournament. Although Prince Alsus approves of his participation after hearing that he is now equal to Choi, he is suspicious of his personality, as the description of the hero Hansu mentioned is similar to Oh Hanwu. So he asks him if he remembers any incident involving a fairy, which Oh Hanwu mistakes as the time he approached Celebless using his blessing. He tries to explain to Alsus that it was a misunderstanding and he just wanted to help her. This makes Alsus certain that the hero Hansu mentioned is Oh Hanwu. He then tells him to return the money he received upon giving up the hero's title. Ohanwu lies and claims that he used up all of the money in his training. To verify this, Alsus challenges him to a spar, to which he arrogantly agrees, and as the fight begins, he uses his fire magic to attack Alsus, but is easily defeated. Alsus then asks the students to raise their hands if they want to participate in the tournament. He also informs them that the students won't receive any protection during the tournament. Some students raise their hands, and then the saintists tell everyone who doesn't want to participate to pack their bags and leave, as the temple is planning to sponsor only the hero, with courage and determination for the selection. Upon hearing this, many students raise their hands in protest, but they are all kicked out, leaving only the high-ranking students. The saintists inform the remaining students that they have passed the first round, and start the second round. Hansu arrives in the city carrying Dialoka on his back. The outsider god comments that his behavior is unlike an outsider, and advises him to abandon the demon. However, Hansu explained that he couldn't abandon her because she was the new translator, as the previous translator, Cogmos, had left, saying that he would return after becoming stronger. The god feels uncomfortable and leaves, and arrives at the temple. There she checks the schedule, and learns about a tournament where the winner's reward is a holy sword and the opportunity to be admitted to the Magic Academy, Hogwarts. The Outsider God loves the idea of getting into Hogwarts Academy. Meanwhile, Hansu arrives at the inn and lays Dialoka down. He checks his stats and notices that the Outsider's blessing is present, which means the Outsider God didn't abandon him. The inn's employee appears and asks about Dialoka being a demon. Before Hansu can reply, his curse massacre is activated, causing the girl to get scared and run away. Although he understands that it's happening because of his curse, it doesn't bother him. While thinking about getting revenge on the thieves who attacked them in the market, the outsider god returns and mentions that her journey was solitary and demands a compliment. After receiving a compliment, god asks Hansu where he is going. He informs her that he is planning to get revenge on the thieves. Outsider god urges him to go to the academy, but Hansu says he'll decide after teaching the thieves a lesson. Outsider god doesn't believe him and throws a tantrum demanding that he promise to go to the academy. But Hansu replied that he would promise if the god helped him teach the thieves a lesson, to which the god agreed. Later, he went to the merchant, and with the god's help, he was able to communicate and buy some slaves to attract the thieves' attention. While they are talking, Hansu is shot by an arrow from one of the thieves, but he easily deflects it and mocks the thief, which causes their boss to confront him with his team. As the fight begins, the outsider god tells Hansu to quickly finish the fight and go to the academy. Hansu agrees and rushes towards them, beating them one by one. The outsider god spins around happily and tells Hansu to quickly massacre them. After defeating all of them, Hansu hands the thief over to the guards and receives money as the thieves have a bounty on them. The guards have brought slimes to clean up, but Hansu notices that the slimes aren't cleaning the bone. The guard informs him that the bone is a special material and the slimes are trained not to eat it. The outsider god tells Hansu to go to the academy, and he asks what's there in an academy. The god replies that he'll find out when he's there. While they are talking, a knight calls out to Hansu from behind, saying something that he misunderstands as the knight trying to capture him for Alsus's death. 
However, the outsider god translates and explains that the knight is actually requesting to buy the bone from him, as he plans to use it to make a gift for his son who will be attending the academy. As the god continues to urge him to attend the academy, Hansu tells the knight that he'll sell the bone on the condition that he lets him attend the academy. The knight says something that Hansu doesn't understand, and the god becomes angry, stomping on the ground to indicate that the knight declined. As Hansu plans to negotiate further, Dialoka appears behind him. Seeing a demon, the knight was about to unsheathe his sword as demons are their natural enemies, but quickly realizes that she is Hansu's slave, as she keeps calling him master. The outsider god urges Hansu to negotiate quickly, but when no results are achieved, the god comes up with a plan and goes somewhere. A few moments later, a giant red dragon appears, and as it gives a menacing speech to the humans, it realizes that its level is one. Hansu quickly figures out that it was the outsider god's doing. Angry that its level was reduced to one, the dragon breathed fire into the city, and the knight rushed to attack it. The outsider god suggested to Hansu that he defeat the dragon quickly and showcase his skills to the knight in order to gain the knight's recognition and enter the academy. Understanding the god's intention, Hansu drew his sword, which Dialoka instantly recognized as the holy sword, and she asked Hansu if he was a hero to which he replied that he isn't and that the sword is defective. As the dragon continued to breathe fire, soldiers prepared their bows and shot arrows at the dragon, further angering it because it was being attacked by mere humans. Just as the dragon was about to breathe fire at the soldiers, the knight arrived and used his sword to block the breath, surprising Hansu, as he didn't expect the knight to be able to block it. Dialoka then informed him that it was expected since the knight was a protector of the country and the dragon wasn't in normal condition. Although the knight managed to protect some soldiers, he couldn't save those who were crushed by the dragon's claw. As the dragon slew more humans, it realized that it could level up, so it planned to massacre the entire city to regain its levels. Hansu commanded Dialoka to distract the dragon while he prepared to slay it, which she accepted, and rushed towards the dragon. In a short amount of time, the dragon had already reached level 27. As Dialoka approached the dragon, it quickly recognized her as a high-ranking demon and planned to use her as experience material. She began collecting mana and used it to throw a beam at the dragon, piercing its wings and injuring it. This enraged the dragon, and it breathed flames at her, but she used mana to create a shield and barely managed to block it. While Hansu is scolded by the outsider god for not acting quickly, he tells the god to be quiet and uses his blessings, outsider, fairy, and the curse, holy sword, to launch an ultimate attack that easily beheads the dragon, causing its demise. This shocks both Dialoka and the outsider god. Before dying, the dragon learns Hansu's level and feels humiliated to be defeated by a level 1 human. So it gives Hansu a curse called King's Wrath, which provokes nearby dragons. If his life is in danger, he will be attacked by dragons. While devastated by receiving another curse, Hansu notices Dialoka's happiness upon seeing her stats. He asks how she can be happy when her master is cursed, to which she replies that it's not the case. Instead, she received a blessing called King's Wrath that puts pressure on nearby dragons, and if her life is endangered, the dragons will protect her. Hansu then turns to the knight, who quickly looks away, indicating that even he received that blessing, which causes him to become more depressed, while the outsider god praises him with a bright smile. Later, Hansu uses slime to manage the collection, but is disappointed that he has to give everything up to the kingdom. If he doesn't, he might get executed, or even worse, caught by the evil god. Meanwhile, the citizens cheer for the knight as he parades the dragon's head around the city. Later that night, Hansu tells Dialoka to inform the knight that he will be giving all of his loot to the city's restoration and the families of the deceased. However, Dialoka twists some words while conveying the message. Hansu then notices a cloud forming above them, which transforms into a bone dragon. Dialoka informs him that it might be the dragon's soul harboring rage towards him, summoned as a physical entity. Hansu thinks that it's not a threat to him as he already defeated a living dragon, and this is just a bone dragon. Meanwhile, in the temple, the Saintus announced the tournament, and the nobles argued about which hero was stronger. Arya hid behind Eubora and informed her that her mother was looking directly at them from the VIP seat. Arya hadn't seen her mother since she left home. Eubora encourages her to be bolder, because if she keeps hiding, her mother might be disappointed. Arya agrees and decides not to hide anymore. 
She then asks Yubora if she would help another hero in trouble, to which Yubora replies that she would because it's something Hansu would do as well. Realizing she thought out loud, she quickly tries to hide her emotions. As the Saintess starts the tournament, Choi and his team rush to a carriage they had prepared beforehand, while Yubora uses her blessing sprint to run faster, carrying Arya. Mion also prepared a carriage and left with her teammates. Later, the Saintess's subordinate informs her that the Red Dragon King, Al Kaiser, has been resurrected. The Saintess quickly recognizes it as she had defeated the dragon alongside a hero hundreds of years ago. Her subordinate thinks that a god might have resurrected the dragon, but she disagrees. The gods would never do such a thing without a reason, and there wasn't even a hero present at the location. She quickly realizes that all the heroes are in the tournament, except for Kang Hansu, and she suspects that there is a god helping him hide from the goddess of heroes. As she went in panic mode, her subordinate informs her that the dragon has already been subjugated. The dragon was at a level where a knight could stop its breath. Hearing this, she concludes that it is not the Dragon King because it's impossible for a knight to stop a Dragon King's breath. She decides to put the matter aside and focus on the tournament instead. At the same time, Ohanwu didn't get a single carriage. Then Julia called out to him, asking what a hero was doing there. As Ohanwu looked at her, he couldn't see her body or her stats because of his curse, see-through. He then used his special blessing on Julia, which compelled her to give him a ride, and they set off for the orc's forest. Meanwhile, the city where Hansu had been was destroyed, and Dialoka was badly injured. Hansu was angry for some reason while two bone dragons fought above him. A few moments ago, as Hansu slew the first bone dragon, his blessings Outsider and King's Wrath simultaneously activated, causing him to summon many skeleton dragons that were after his life. As the knight was attacked, his blessing King's Wrath activated, and another bone dragon was summoned to protect him, causing the dragons to fight each other. At some point, even Dialoka got knocked up. Hansu then decided to finish it, and used his sword to slay all of the dragons at once. After all the dragons had died, Dialoka asked Hansu if he knew what caused this, to which he replied that it was because of his blessing, Outsider. Unlike werewolves who get their power by eating meat, he gets his powers by using his life force. King's Wrath Curse triggers every time his life is in danger. An Outsider, which resets his stats, causes an infinite loop that keeps summoning dragons. But at some point, even his curse got reset and stopped. As the dragon bone was still a rare material, Hansu decided to give all of it to Dialoka. Then, the knight rose up from the grave of bones and requested Hansu to go to the academy together with his son, which made the outsider god extremely happy and praised themselves for the perfect plan. Having no other choice, Hansu accepted the invitation and arrived at the knight's mansion to meet his son. During their dinner, Dialoka translated the knight's words and explained that he wants Hansu to go to the academy with his oldest son instead of the youngest. The youngest already had a partner, while the oldest had dropped out but could return to the academy. Hansu agreed, which made the parents happy. Dialoka then mistranslated their words and falsely claimed that they wanted to bribe him with money. Hansu quickly realized she was lying. He then instructed her to translate that he had accepted the offer. Dialoka complied and said that Hansu wanted to see the face of the disgraceful son who hides when there are guests in the house. Before Hansu could stop her, he noticed the knight and his wife on the ground, crying. He asked Dialoka what she had said, and she replied that she had done an excellent demonic translation. Later, when Hansu was resting in the guest room, he asked Dialoka if she had any information on the academy. She informed him that the academy was founded by humans to oppose the demons and taught about battle. Despite all their efforts, humans were still weak so it had become a place for networking. At the end of the explanation, the knight's oldest son appeared and challenged Hansu to a duel, calling him level one. Hansu quickly understood his words without translation, and since the guy's father put his son in Hansu's care, he planned to teach him a lesson by giving him a good beating. While beating the guy, Hansu tells him that his father had done so much for him, so he should at least perform his duty as a son. The guy finally faints due to Hansu's beating. Hansu then remembers the scenario when he told the goddess to send him home as he worried about his family. He quickly snaps out of it and realizes that he has gone too far. Dialoka informed him that the guy didn't die and was only unconscious. Later, when the guy regained consciousness, he quickly tried to run away, but he was shot by Dialoka's mana and fell unconscious again. Hansu then asked Dialoka what they should do with him, 
to which she suggested that they should make his body unrecognizable to avoid being executed. Hansu quickly declined and took him to the knight, who brought a healer to heal his son. Upon waking up, the guy quickly tried to attack Hansu. Seeing that the guy hadn't learned his lesson, Hansu used his curse king's wrath to summon a bone dragon and got crushed in its jaw, which scared the guy. Hansu then broke the dragon's teeth and emerged from it, saying that they would be good friends. Meanwhile, in the temple, the saintess received a message from her subordinate, who informed her that the incident involving the dragon had been closed. Although there was significant damage to the city, there weren't many casualties. The subordinate also informed her that the head of Hogwarts Academy wanted to have a talk with her. As she connected her communication orb with the Academy, a green-haired lady greeted the saintess and teased her for her cold personality. Just as the saintess was about to hang up, the lady got straight to the point and informed her that they were planning to open an underground labyrinth so freshmen could study alongside the heroes. The saintess was surprised because the labyrinth had been sealed for a long time and they had managed to succeed in unsealing it. The labyrinth was a place where gods used to overuse their power in the mythological ages, and that's why the relics in the labyrinth possessed extraordinary power. However, along with that power came great dangers. As it could be a valuable experience for the heroes, she promised to send them to the academy after the tournament ends. As their conversation ended, the saintess wondered how many heroes would survive. Meanwhile, Julia introduces Laisha to Ohanwu, and as he greets her, he falls into a delusion of having them fall in love with him. However, Laisha doesn't reciprocate his feelings. She quickly understands the context of the tournament and checks Oh Han Wu's blessings. She notices that he has many low rank blessings despite being just level 6, so she mistakes him for someone chosen by the gods. However, she isn't that impressed, as she has already seen Hansu, who is far more capable. Later that night, they didn't find any orcs. After analyzing the surroundings, Laisha figures out that another party must have arrived before them. Looking at the slime that is still cleaning up the area, it means that the party must be nearby. As Julia follows the slimes, she comes across orc bodies. After analyzing their burns and cuts, Julia quickly deduces that the team must consist of a swordsman and a sorcerer. Suddenly, Ohanwu hears the sound of someone fighting. After following it, they witness Yubora and Arya battling orcs. Yubora uses her fire magic while Arya uses her swordsmanship. As Arya is about to be attacked, Yubora uses her warrior blessing to block the blow and easily defeats the orc. Oh Hanwu calls out to Yubora, questioning how a meek class president could be so strong. She replies that excellent students with high overall performance always become class presidents, and it's the same here. The only difference is that this is happening in a fantasy world. Oh Hanwu refuses to believe this as he read in the novel that only protagonists are supposed to be strong. A certain male god shakes their head, and the childish god lightly agrees with them. As Yubora and Arya are leaving, Ohanwu shouts at them, expressing his wish for her to get second place. In response, she mocks him, saying that she wishes him to get first place. He misinterprets her words by thinking that she is cheering for him, and assumes that she is the female protagonist who will also fall in love with him. Another god seriously wonders if a powerful curse has to be placed on him. As they were distracted, orcs emerged from behind Laisha and Julia. They quickly prepared for battle, but Ohanwu insisted on fighting them alone and told them to stay back and watch. He used fire magic to attack the orcs, but due to his curse, hunting, which strengthened all nearby monsters, his fire magic had no effect on the orcs, and he was sent flying. Although he hit the ground really hard, he was able to survive thanks to his blessing survival, which increased his chances of not dying. If he wondered how he survived, he would get a headache. Laisha and Julia realized that heroes aren't that big of a deal compared to Hansu, who had defeated a level 16 orc despite being only level 1. Laisha then asked Julia if they would be able to meet Hansu again, to which she replied that they would if he came to the academy. The fight began with Julia using her swordsmanship and Laisha employing her magic to attack the orcs who were strengthened because of Ohanwu's hunting curse. Despite that, they were able to defeat all the orcs. Laisha asked Julia what they should do about the unconscious hero. She suggested Julia carry him on her back, but Julia declined, saying her back hurt. Laisha also complained of back pain, indicating that neither of them wanted to carry Ohanwu. Observing the scenario, a certain evil god burst into laughter. Meanwhile, Choi arrives in the forest and sees Mian who caught up with them using a carriage. 
He calls her a coward, and she responds by pointing out that he was the one who used the carriage first. Choi warns her not to disturb him during his hunting. In response, she mocks him, stating that his weak threats won't work. Unable to tolerate her mocking, he leaves. Later, Choi begins hunting by commanding his team to use fire magic while he utilizes his swordsmanship to deliver the final blow. While Mian's team is surrounded by orcs, and one of them has even lost an arm. Mian herself is also cornered by orcs due to her blessing charm. Realizing the situation, she quickly shouts for help, and the guy who lost his arm rushes to protect her, but stumbles upon a dead orc's arm and falls. Another team member suggests that Mian be used as bait while they run away, as she has the saint's backing and probably wouldn't die. The guy with glasses agrees with the idea. Mian is shocked that her teammates betrayed her and regrets not returning to Earth with Hansu. She then resigns herself to being the bait, but the guy who lost his arm, Baek Ilman, refuses to run away and tells Mian not to give up. She ignores him and lures the orcs using her blessing to the other side, and as they capture her, she closes her eyes, awaiting her demise. Then she hears Baek Ilman's voice, and as she opens her eyes, she sees that his arm has miraculously healed, and all the orcs are defeated. Baek Ilman then faints, while a certain demon god is proud of the contract they made. Later, as the tournament ends, the saintess is surprised by the outcome, as according to her plan, Eubora should have won. Her subordinate advises her to inform Hiro Choi about Hansu's bag and requests his cooperation. However, the saintess believes that Hiro Choi is still not trustworthy enough. She decides to put the matter about Hansu's bag aside for now and gets ready to announce the tournament's victor. As Hansu made his way to the academy with the knight's son Taker, he wondered if it was okay for him to enter the academy while being chased by the royals. The outsider god assured him that everything was all right. Hansu then asked the reason why the god insisted on him attending the academy, threatening not to buy picture books if the god didn't tell him. The outsider god criticized his savage threats and threatened Hansu that she would cry. As they arrived at the Hogwarts Academy, the knight's first son handed the admission permit to the guards, which was confirmed by the teachers, while Tyker panicked about returning to the academy he hated the most. As they entered the academy, Hansu noticed that it was more like a military base than a typical academy. The knight's youngest son then informed him that many people would be watching, and calling him by his first name would be weird. Hansu had already expected this, as he had enrolled in the academy with the identity of a young master's servant, so he told the youngest son to call him whatever he felt comfortable with. The girl sitting next to him introduced herself as Salona and expressed her hopes of getting along. As he checked her stats, he noticed the curse nobility, which meant that she was a former noble. Later, he wore uniforms and prepared for the admission test, but Dialoka commented that the uniform didn't suit him, and it was obvious that he would be ignored since he was only level one. She advised him to dye the uniform in a catchy color like red, but Hansu declined, as it was not allowed, and commanded her to stay in the dormitory. Later, as the exam began, the teacher was amazed by the fact that Hansu managed to pass all the physical exams despite being a level one. The teacher asked if he knew about fairy applicants, thinking it was a common question in the exam. Hansu answered that he knew a bit about them, as he had been shot by a fairy's arrow. The teacher found his answer interesting, considering the fact that he was able to face off against fairies with bows despite his curse and mixed blessings. As a result, the teacher gave him a pass on the test. As they shook hands, the teacher told him to always seek his help if anything happened, to which Hansu gracefully accepted and left. As he was heading to his dorm room, the outsider god urged him to go to the statue. Hansu inquired why, and the god replied that they liked the statue. Later, when he arrived in front of the statue, the knight's youngest son called out to him and informed him that it was a statue of the hero Padonicus, who was summoned in ancient times. Then suddenly, a senior called out to Hansu and told him to hang the cloth. Hansu questioned what was on it, and the senior replied that it was for welcoming the heroes who would be attending the academy. He quickly realized that the heroes were his former classmates. As he started to panic, the outsider god assured him that everything was still all right and that the other gods weren't around. If the classmates arrived, Hansu would meet the goddess and the other gods, although he planned to avoid meeting them until he grew stronger. However, he decided to trust the outsider god, which made the god really happy. Suddenly the senior called out to him again and told him something that he didn't understand. Then the guy grabbed Hansu by the collar 
and took him somewhere where he saw another freshman student getting bullied. The guy then pinned Hansu to the wall and informed him that they were in a place where even the staff doesn't come, meaning there was no surveillance either. Hansu took the opportunity and grabbed the guy by his neck, summoning a portal from which he took out a hammer and used it to hit the guy in the head. He then went to the other senior who was beating up a freshman and also grabbed her by the neck. He told the freshman to leave, and as he did, Hansu began to beat the seniors. Later at night, he arrived in the dorm and saw Dialoka on the bed. He asked her that if she were to take up the entire bed herself, where would he suppose to sleep? She replied that she was just making sure that Salona didn't take the window bed. Hansu was shocked to learn that in the academy, they allowed boys and girls to stay in the same room. He then asked Dialoka where she would be sleeping, to which she informed him that ordinary slaves were supposed to sleep on the floor. Since she was not ordinary, she would sleep next to him. However, he quickly declined and planned on sleeping somewhere else. He then told her to follow him somewhere, to which she happily agreed, and asked where. He informed her that they would sneak into the academy late at night. Later, Hansu and Dialoka arrived at a hotel to look for the senior who could help them sneak into the academy. After finding the guy, Hansu explained that he needed his help to silently infiltrate the academy, and offered him money. Although the guy agreed, he didn't trust Hansu because he had brought a high-level demon with him. He then told Hansu to leave the girl behind, and go. Dialoka then kicked the guy in the face, causing others to rush in and attack her. But she easily managed to defeat them. While they were fighting, Hansu caught a glimpse of Dialoka's black panties, but quickly snapped out of it, and decided to leave. Later at midnight, Hansu attacked a senior and took her cape. Although he was able to enter the academy quietly, he realized that it would be difficult if more people arrived, and it would be troublesome to immobilize them instead of ending them. Later, Dialoka asked why they had come to the academy so late at night, to which Hansu replied that he had some business with the statue. Upon seeing the statue, Dialoka informed him that Padonicus was a hero's comrade, and he tried to go for the hero's lady, but was expelled. As Padonicus held resentment against the heroes, he swore allegiance to the vampire queen, resulting in him becoming a vampire and ultimately succeeding in kidnapping the lady. Dialoka also informed him that she once heard that the statue contained a clue. She then told Hansu to look closely at the statue of Padonicus and the female swordsman he had kidnapped. Although there wasn't a path between them, it was strange that there wasn't a single obstacle between them. Moreover, Padonicus was looking at the swordsman, but she was looking somewhere else. So Dialoka suggested that they follow the direction where the female swordsman was looking. After following it, they found a map engraved in the ground. Dialoka quickly recognized it as a map of the area near the lake. However, that area was vast, and it would be impossible to search the entire area. But there was a legend that a freshwater mermaid who lived there turned into stone while endlessly waiting for Padonicus. Hansu then asked how far the place was, to which Dialoka pointed at the mermaid statue, stating it was here. Seeing the statue, Hansu wondered why she was crying while looking down. He then checked the statue's viewing direction, and suddenly something started to glow in his hand that appeared to be a ring. While wondering what it could be, he received a blessing called forgiveness that made others confess their sins when looking at his merciful face, and also made them forgive his sins looking at his sad face. Although Hansu was happy that he finally received a blessing and not a curse, a certain god didn't like the development and was extremely uncomfortable. Later, he was caught by the teachers who questioned Hansu's identity as he was being escorted by a high-ranking demon and didn't appear to be ordinary. He assured them that he was just a normal student, but the teachers didn't trust him. So he used his blessing of forgiveness to escape the situation, and it worked as all the teachers forgave him and left. Dialoka told him not to use this blessing on her, as she would forgive him even if he didn't use it. To this, Hansu replied that he was already using it on her. She then asked what sin he committed against her, which he didn't tell her about, getting a glimpse of her panties. In the morning, all the students arrived at the academy as today was their first day. Then the teacher began the introduction of the teaching staff, starting with the professor who would be handling the newly established subject, the Guardian of Flames. Miss Celebliss. As she introduced herself, Hansu didn't remember her. Instead, he felt familiar with the phoenix on her shoulder, and remembered a moment that he considered to be a bad memory. 
Then the principal came to the stage and informed everyone that this year at Hogwarts Academy would be the most important year, as the heroes would take admission. Hearing this news, the students were confused. Then the principal used magic to make a loud noise that almost made the students go deaf. She then told everyone to be quiet and explained that the classes would be divided into upper class and lower class. The rule was simple. They just had to fight until half of them collapsed. As she began the fight, the whole area became chaotic, and all the students started fighting each other. Meanwhile, a certain god was excited about the noisy atmosphere, and Hansu also began fighting, easily defeating all the students. While a certain god prayed for the peace of all the students, later, as the fight ended, the teacher welcomed Hansu and the others to the upper classes. She also reminded them that if their results weren't good, they could always be sent to the middle class. She informed everyone that the subjects were categorized into two paths, knight and mage, and told them to choose the subject that suited them. She also announced that the class president title was given to Prince Razel. Meanwhile in the temple, the saintess announced Choi as the tournament winner. She congratulated him and gave him the holy sword, a symbol of a hero that would help him grow stronger faster. She then told him to shout, I want to become stronger, while holding the sword. When he did, a portal similar to Hansu's opened, and he was teleported to the orc sanctuary where he met Bruce, who welcomed him. As he was about to ask about the place, the guardian orc arrived and informed him that according to the rules, his training would begin. Meanwhile, the teacher wouldn't let Hansu join the classes, saying he wasn't prepared. When he asked why he couldn't join, the teacher informed him that those who didn't have the warrior's blessing couldn't attend his classes. He was then kicked out. Although he was extremely angry, he calmed himself down and remembered that most of the people he knew had the warrior's blessing. Pissed off, he used his blessings outsider and fairy to burst open the door and showed the teacher his sword aura. Although the teacher was amazed, he still refused to accept him. So, Hansu extended the aura more, causing the teacher to accept him. He then asked the knight's youngest son how to learn the warrior's blessing, to which he replied that he learned it by using medicine, which made Hansu disgusted, as they didn't put any effort into it. Then he was approached by the class president, who praised him for his performance at the entrance ceremony, and told him that if he became his subordinate, he would provide him with medicine that could help him get the warrior's blessing. Hansu declined, which made the guy angry. However, Hansu used his new blessing of forgiveness to easily make the guy forgive him. The outsider god was sure that Hansu was the type to become the class president, so the god was looking forward to the later development. Later, as starting with theoretical class right from the first day would be boring, the teacher prepared something that all the students would love, the dragon bone that had been subjugated recently, which he bought with his ten years of savings. Hansu was surprised as he didn't expect to see this again and thought that the world was indeed small. After the classes, as Hansu and the others were discussing about the next class, three students called out to Hansu, and he quickly recognized them as the ones he sent to the lower class. He then told everyone to leave and decided to follow them as he was getting bored anyway. They led him to a place where Taker had been beaten up by the students who had lost to Hansu in the admission ceremony. It appeared that they wanted revenge for their humiliation. Hansu then opened a portal and took out a bone, easily defeating one of them, and challenged the other to come at him. The blonde-haired guy was shocked, as Hansu had been able to defeat the Prince of the Kingdom of Mercenary, who used heavy swordsmanship, a strong opponent against whom even he couldn't win. Hansu had also easily defeated the Princess of the Kingdom of Lake, who used her flexible body like a mermaid to deflect any attack. As there were only a few students left, Hansu provoked them, causing the guys to rush to attack him. But before they could do anything, his curse massacre and annihilation caused all the ghosts of the monsters who had died by his hand to appear and haunt the students. Hansu was confused as to why his curses had activated, and decided to end all of them quickly. Later, he went to Taker, who was pretending to be unconscious. Hansu told him to take the blame for defeating the royal students, as no one would believe that a level one could defeat them. Although the guy strongly opposed it, he had no other choice but to accept. Hansu then suspected that the guardian orc was spying on him, as he hadn't specified what he needed, but received a perfect bone with blood on it. A certain god asked for his opinion, but Hansu was sure the orc didn't send him something that he used to beat up others, as he had told the orc not to attack the natives who lived there. Meanwhile, in the orc's sanctuary, Choi repeatedly lost to the orc and got beaten while the orc felt bored, 
as he needed to control his power while attacking him. The orc then told Choi to get up and start over again. Although Choi knew that the Guardian Orc was a different level from the other orcs, he thought that this training would make him stronger and believed himself to be the legendary hero. He rushed towards the monster with his delusion, but he was easily caught, causing his bone to shatter, and he received a headbutt. Then, the orc threw him into the air while launching a punch at him. Meanwhile, Cogmos wondered why Dialoka was with Hansu and arrived at the Goblin Cave, where all the goblins welcomed him and called him the king. He quickly sensed something and recognized the creepy feeling that indicated a saintess was nearby. As the students arrived in the forest, they came across goblins, and thinking they were just measly goblins, they rushed to attack them, only to fall into their traps. Mion used fire magic to easily defeat some of them, and the remaining goblins were defeated by Eubora and Arya. Princess Athena informed Eubora that goblins were indeed weaker than orcs, but they shouldn't let their guard down since the goblins moved in groups and were able to set up traps. She also thinks that the armor made of dragon's bone triggered the goblins, so she tried to figure something out and decided that she and Prince Alsus would accompany the hero to compensate for the reduced number of members. Later, Eubora analyzed the area and found many traps, and although most of them were simple, some of them were quite dangerous. Alsus then advised the students to prepare a camp for today, as night falls quickly in the forest. After finishing preparations, a knight informed Alsus that they found footprints near the traps, and there were traces of the traps being dismantled and rebuilt. As the enemy could be a human, or even worse, a demon, he instructed the knight to report the situation to the saintess. Some days later, at night, Mion used fire magic to defeat some goblins, while Eubora attacked a giant goblin but found it difficult to cut through. She was then helped by Alsus, who ordered all the knights to raise their swords and protect the heroes, as the goblins' sneak attacks kept occurring every night, and it was better to be careful. Meanwhile, Cogmos was sitting on the throne while a goblin bowed in front of him. The goblin informed him that their situation was a little bad, which shocked him, as he didn't expect the goblins to stand a chance against the hero and get annihilated. He quickly figured out that it was all because of Hansu, who massacred the orcs and werewolves, causing the hero's training to be lacking. So they came here to find prey, which meant he only had to face newbie heroes. He then ordered the goblin to quickly gather and prepare for an attack. Later, the goblins started to destroy their supplies instead of attacking the heroes, and when Mion tried to attack them, they easily dodged her every attack. Then a blue goblin appeared and shouted something, causing all the goblins to retreat. Thinking it was the commander, Eubora tried to follow it, but the blue goblin was actually Cogmos, who had disguised himself as a goblin through his research with his slaves. He then used one of his abilities and shouted out loud, causing all the heroes to have headaches while the goblins rushed to attack them. Somehow, they managed to survive and arrived at the camp, where Mion was covered in bandages, while Eubora was so tired that she developed dark circles under her eyes. Alsus was confused about the fact that the number of goblins they had defeated was similar to last year, but the blue goblin was remarkably stronger, and they needed to find a way to deal with it for the sake of the knight who sacrificed his life. Then, Princess Athena informed them that the saintess had found the real culprit, a demon hiding in the rock mountain. Meanwhile, the saintess was planning to accelerate the hero's growth through goblin hunting, but now they had lost a knight, and his corpse hadn't even been found. Despite all that, she still thought that this would be a great experience for the heroes and ordered her subordinates to pay close attention to them, as she could resurrect dead people but couldn't do anything about their state of mind. She then went into the goblins' forest, a wasteland, and used her blessings to grow plants there, which solved their food issue for now. But it was still meaningless to stay there, so she told her subordinates to prepare the heroes to get rid of the demon culprit. Meanwhile, Cogmos noticed the changes in the forest and was angry as to why the saintess was intervening. While he was thinking of a way, his slaves asked if he had any plans, to which he shouted at them and told them to shut up. He knew that the goblin and he would end up dying no matter what, but it would be possible to save the human girls. He thought to himself how ridiculous it was for someone who had always prioritized his life over everything else, and now trying to sacrifice his life to save humans. Meanwhile, Mion reached level 13 while hunting and planned to catch up with Eubora. However, she was troubled by the fact that she was deep inside the forest and out of mana. As she was planning to return, two goblins arrived and attacked her. At the same time, 
Hansu was following the direction indicated by the ring's light, which suddenly disappeared, indicating his arrival at the destination. He was then attacked by fire magic from above, which turned out to be from the magic teacher who scolded him. Hansu used his blessing of forgiveness, and the teacher forgave him, explaining that it was the magic shooting range. Hansu then encountered Leisha, whom he didn't recognize at first, but then remembered her and called her Leia. Leisha corrected him, stating that her name is Leisha, not Leia. This made Hansu angry, adding to his growing list of bothersome situations. Leisha asked Hansu what he was doing in the magic shooting range and if he wanted to learn magic. Hansu replied that he couldn't use magic, to which Leisha offered to teach him so he could be prepared to face a mage in the future. Hansu accepted her offer, and Leisha told him to be there the next day at the same time before leaving. Hansu then asked the god about the magic shooting range and if there was something hidden there. The god tried to avoid the question, which indicated that there was indeed something there. As they were talking, the class president called out to him, expressing anger at having been looking for him. Hansu attempted to use his blessing of forgiveness to escape the situation, but for some reason, it didn't work. This confused Hansu, who suspected that the class president had checked his stats. The class president suggested that they team up to become the strongest in the academy, to which he agreed as he heard that there would be group assignments and it would be better to work with someone from the same class. The outsider god felt uncomfortable, and so after arriving at the dorm, he asked Dialoka how to hide the status windows. She explained that in order to peek at someone's status window, one needed a blessing, and resisting it also required a blessing. Hansu asked which blessing would be easier to get, to which she replied that there were many blessings, but none of them were easy to obtain. Suddenly Salona appeared and suggested that it didn't have to be a blessing. He could also use a curse, although it would be dangerous. Hansu liked the idea, while Dialoka stared at Salona maliciously, but she acknowledged her idea, despite her being a mere human, and suggested that Hansu obtain the Curse of Avarice, which exercises absolute control over possession, including the status window. The price for this curse is the owner's life. Hansu liked the idea and schemed something while a certain god stated that his expression looked suspicious. Hansu declined the god's suspicions. Later they arrived at the mercenary guild where Hansu registered Dialoka as a mercenary. When she asked why, he explained that in order to gain the curse of avarice, he needed to own many slaves or possess a lot of wealth. By increasing her level to an extent that even he couldn't handle at his current level, he would receive the curse. Although Dialoka agreed, she worried about her curse hunting and explained that it was a powerful curse that could make an orc as strong as an ogre, comparable to the knight they had encountered. Hansu reassured her telling her not to worry too much, as they were just going to hunt some werewolves. As they started to hunt the werewolves, Dialoka used her aura to attack, but due to her curse hunting, the attack was shallow. Hansu stepped in and easily slew all the werewolves. He then instructed Dialoka to bring their canines, and for some reason, she burst into laughter. Hansu noticed a slime eating one of the werewolves and told Dialoka to bring them right away, which she happily accepted indicating that she had started to like Hansu. The next morning, Hansu arrived at the academy, where Taker complained that because of his fault, they had to clean the restroom for fifteen days. Then Leisha called out to Hansu, which made Taker angry, as he had a crush on her. He asked about their relationship, and Hansu slammed him, expressing frustration at everyone making a fuss about everything. Leisha informed him that she would teach him magic after classes today, and then left. Hansu then dragged Taker to the low-class dorm, and upon arriving, Hansu was surprised by the dorm's condition. Then, Prince Alpis from the Night Kingdom, whom Hansu had beaten earlier, called out to him with his gang and kneeled, stating that they were representing their country. Kneeling in front of him was shameful, but they wanted to reconcile with him because if they didn't reach a higher class in the next exam, they would lose their titles as nobles and be cursed. After checking their stats, Hansu learned that those with the noble blessing had to distribute their experience to their blood kin, as it would become harder for them to level up in the future. Hansu promised that he wouldn't bother them and told them to do what they wanted. This made all the guys happy, and they thanked Hansu, while a certain god became angry and protested that mingling with them was not what an outsider should do and that they were not trustworthy. Later, as Hansu walked with Leisha, he was angry because everyone was looking at him strangely due to the guys kneeling earlier. 
He asked her where they were going, and she replied that they were going to a place where no one could disturb them. Hearing this, both the outsider god and Hansu were shocked as they misinterpreted her words. They quickly realized that it was not what she meant. She then informed him that she had recently worked with a hero, which shocked Hansu. Leisha continued to explain that she had worked with the hero for a short period of time, but quit because he was too much for her to handle, as the guy hunts recklessly. Hansu quickly realized that she was talking about Oh Hanwu, who used to read fantasy novels every day. He speculated that Oh Hanwu must have adapted quickly due to his knowledge of fantasy worlds, while Outsider God tilted their head at his thought and giggled slightly. Later, as they arrived at their destination, Leisha helped Hansu meditate, which worked, and he felt something hot rising. However, the Outsider God felt very uncomfortable and punched him. Hansu ignored the God and continued to feel the increasing magic. Suddenly his blessing outsider activated, causing the magic to disappear, while the outsider god felt proud and joyful. Then, his blessing, outsider, ranked up from E to D, causing his body to overflow with energy and make it unstable. He quickly realized that if he tried to control it, his strength balance would collapse. So he gathered all his energy in his hand and shot it into the sky. While he felt refreshed, Leisha was shocked and asked him how he used magic. Seeing his dumbfounded expression, she realized that he used magic without even knowing it. Now that Hansu knew he could use magic, he tried to do it again and shot it into the sky several times. The teacher noticed and rushed to see who was using magic recklessly on campus. Upon seeing Hansu, who had skipped swordsmanship class and was now using magic, the teacher decided to teach him a lesson and told him to give up on magic. Hansu quickly tried to use his blessing of forgiveness to counter the situation, but it was nullified. As the guy rushed to attack him, Hansu used magic to counterattack. Later, he was forced to attend the magic class, although the teacher forgave him. He told Hansu to attend the magic classes sincerely, which he accepted. Then he noticed that everyone had partners, and since the class president didn't arrive, he went to sit next to Prince Alpis. Although Alpis initially refused to sit next to Hansu, he later accepted due to Hansu's threats. Then Celebless arrived with her phoenix, and introduced herself as the magic class teacher. Her phoenix flew over to Hansu and started glaring at him, confusing him as to why the bird was acting this way only towards him. Teacher Celebless announced that the class would be held twice every month. Thinking it was a good idea, Hansu asked the prince's opinion, but messed up his name and called him Mulpus, to which the prince shouted loudly, correcting him that his name was Alpus, not Mulpus. As Celebless scolded the prince, she noticed Hansu sitting next to him and became flustered. She quickly withdrew her statement and said that the class would end today and left, saying that from tomorrow onward, they would have classes every day at the same time. Hearing that classes would be held every day, Hansu blamed Alpis while wondering why he keeps meeting guys like Cogmos. Meanwhile, Mion woke up and met Cogmos, who welcomed her into his cradle and introduced himself as the fourteenth son of the Dark King, Cogmos. Although Mion was shocked, she was attracted to his looks and voice. Thinking that even the son of the Dark King was considered a prince, she decided to seize the opportunity and used her blessing charm to charm Cogmos. However, it didn't work on him, as he easily nullified her blessing and eliminated her, causing him to receive the Curse Hero, which reduced his experience points obtained through hunting and achievements. He was mortified as he couldn't level up anymore, meaning he couldn't take Dialoka from Hansu. Suddenly, a goblin informed him that he had a guest, who turned out to be Eubora. She quickly noticed Mion's dead body and prepared to attack, while Cogmos introduced himself and asked why she was alone. Prince Alsus appeared from behind and replied that she wasn't alone. Cogmos was shocked as Prince Alsus had many high-ranking blessings. Now that he had come this far, he couldn't back away. So he introduced himself as the one who rules over the goblins of the Rock Mountain, Cogmos. Princess Athena also arrived and asked if the trap was his doing, to which he replied affirmatively. Alsus then rushed to attack him, but Cogmos told him not to, as he had set up a trap that could potentially destroy Mion's body beyond resurrection. Alsus rushed to protect Mion, but was too slow, so Eubora used her blessing sprint to move quickly, but fell into Cogmos's trap. He then used a magical string to pull Mion's body away. As Eubora was in trouble, Alsus pushed her away, placing himself under the trap. Then, Princess Athena used her fire magic to destroy the trap, despite that he was badly injured. However, 
Cogmos's trap didn't end there, as he brought out two giant crossbows and threw me on to the other side, but Eubora managed to save her. As she looked behind, she saw Alsus covered in arrows, and Cogmos respected him for sacrificing himself to save a hero's life. Angry, Princess Athena prepared her fire magic to attack Cogmos, but quickly stopped as he used Alsus's body as a shield, and informed her that if she used her fire magic, Alsus couldn't be resurrected. While she was distracted, he shot an arrow through Alsus's cape, causing her demise. He then went to Eubora, who called him a coward. He replied that it was they who brought an entire knight unit just to slay some goblins, and he was only at level 22 while she was at level 19. But her standards of blessing were way higher than his, so if she hadn't let her guard down, it would have been him who would have ended up dead. He then advised her that in war, where everyone is an enemy, one should not be picky about the means and methods when their life is on the line. She accepted the advice and rushed to attack him, but he quickly blocked it. Then he took off his suit that was made of dark magic and used it to wrap around her body, which made her unable to move, and as she couldn't breathe, she closed her eyes and thought about Hansu. Suddenly the saintess appeared from above, stating that this was not the kind of ending she wanted and saying that demon Cogmos had crossed the line. At Hogwarts Academy, the principal asks the head teacher how Professor Celebliss is doing, to which he replies that her classes for building trust with monsters are difficult, so no achievements were made by the students. At this rate, there will be no rewards from the teacher's blessing either. Hearing this bad news, she becomes frustrated as she was finally able to get the heroes to attend the academy to improve its reputation. The head teacher then tells her to calm down, as there's still some good news. There's a student with a fairy blessing rank C, who will bring good results together with Celebliss. Meanwhile, Celebliss welcomes Hansu into her class, but she gets angry when he addresses her as a teacher. She tells him not to use such formal titles when it's just the two of them, and tells him to start over again, and not to use a formal title this time. Hansu awkwardly laughs, and understands that he has chosen the wrong class. Earlier on the first day of class, students had to interact with slimes, but they couldn't get the slimes' attention, and ended up chasing them. Then Hansu takes out a bone which attracts all the slimes' attention. This surprises Celebliss, and she praises Hansu for his cleverness in using something that the slimes are fond of, so she decides to give him special classes. Back in the present, Hansu awkwardly addresses her as Miss Celebliss, which she accepts. She then blushingly explains that today's class will be about his attitude when dealing with monster partners. To demonstrate, he has to pretend to be her slime partner. So she sits down near a tree and tells Hansu to lie down on her lap just like a slime. Although he is taken aback, he decides to go along with it. However, he realizes that if it weren't for his blessing, he would have gotten an erection by now. The outsider god watches him with narrowed eyes and suspicion, while Celebliss smiles brightly at him. His constant interactions with girls make him wonder if the academy is crazy, or if this world is crazy. Later at night, Dialoka is fighting against some werewolves who taunt her. As they rush to attack, she easily rips one of their hands off and eliminates the rest using fire magic. She then starts looking for Hansu, who is chasing a werewolf with a bone. After defeating all the werewolves, he uses slime to take care of the collection and checks Dialoka's stats. Although she leveled up a lot, he still hasn't acquired the Curse of Avarice that he needs to hide his stats. Nevertheless, he managed to achieve some good results. Earlier, the mercenary guildmaster told Dialoka to stop bringing only proof of subjugation, as it's not proper to bring only ears, and the guild's safe is completely empty while they haven't gained anything. Dialoka tells him that if he had a problem, he should have changed the contents of the request earlier, as she had already taken care of it. Annoyed, the guy gives her another request, which is an S-rank request, enough to satisfy her demands. Back in the present day, Hansu is annoyed that the S-rank request turns out to be a digging job for an underground ruin. He asks for Dialoka's help, but she declines, saying she is exhausted from hunting werewolves. Knowing it's a lie, he persuades her while the outsider god cheers for the lone wolf. After digging for a while, Hansu realized that it would take a long time, so he decided to blow everything up with one shot. However, Dialoka informed him that he might destroy important remains that held great secrets. This would result in a failed mission for the request. She suggested that getting manpower would be a faster solution. Hearing this, Hansu contacted the guardian orc through his holy sword and asked him to send some people with digging equipment. Soon, 
a portal opened, and many people with equipment emerged from it. Dialoka was amazed, and asked if it was magic created by the Guardian Orc. Hansu questioned whether she had just noticed it now, since Cogmos had asked him the moment he saw it. Comparing someone like Cogmos made Dialoka feel offended, while Hansu thought it was unfair to the guy. As they watched people dig, the outsider god criticized Hansu, saying it's not what an outsider should do. Hansu explained that letting others work for him still qualified him as an outsider. The outsider god was amazed by his wisdom. He then asked Dialoka how the number of people had increased, and she replied that he had bought many slaves earlier who had moved to the orc sanctuary. Then a girl named Yao, who came with the workers from the portal, offers Hansu some food. While he's eating, she informs him that a hero has come to the orc sanctuary to train and become strong. Hansu thinks that going there himself might expose him to the goddess of heroes, so he decides to avoid going there for a while. As the sun rises, he decides to head back to the academy and leaves Dialoka in charge of the workers. She then looks menacingly at the workers, but a bald guy reassures everyone that she is under Hansu's control. In the morning, Hansu wonders why Celebliss keeps looking for him and why he can't understand what goes on in her class, where they spend the entire lecture staring at each other. He speculates that it might be because of his fairy blessing. He then asks the outsider God's opinion, who is visibly angry and uncomfortable, stating that his credit is going down. As they were conversing, a teacher called out to him and informed him that regardless of his midterm exam results, he would remain in the higher class, as they would never send a student of Professor Celebliss into the lower class. However, he would have to attend supplementary classes to pass the midterm exam. This shocked Hansu and he asked why she is telling him this so late. She then held his hand and explained that this is a matter of the Academy's and Celebless's prestige, so he must pass the exam. Hansu moved his hand away and awkwardly agreed to try his best. The teacher then returned to her normal self and left, leaving Hansu shocked. While the outsider god saw it as a perfect opportunity to punish Celebless, but Hansu tells her not to, as shaming her would also shame him and expose his lack of capability meaning that the outsider god who gave him the blessing is also incapable. The outsider god calls it all nonsense, but now that he has to attend supplementary classes, he aims for the top result to easily pass the midterm exam, to which the outsider god agrees. Later, he arrives at the digging area where Dialoka smelled Hansu and asks why he reeked of a female fairy. He told her to quit talking nonsense and follow him, to which she happily complied. They later arrived at the forest, and Dialoka asked why they were here, and why they were so high up. He explains that they're here to catch a powerful monster, and he's hiding to make capturing it easier with a surprise attack. Dialoka then asks why he is looking for something else when he is already raising a powerful demon like her, to which he replies that it's because of a test. Then the outsider god suggested a giant dragon, which annoyed him as it isn't something he could train yet. Dialoka suggests a dark dragon or a flying serpent, which might be perfect for him. He asked how he is supposed to find something like that in this place, to which Dialoka replied that there was another option that might be perfect, which is herself. Hearing this, Hansu became really angry and wondered if he should just eliminate her. On Earth, imaginary things that don't exist in reality are referred to as monsters, but in this world, monsters are differentiated by whether they eat slime or not. He then notices an elephant-type monster attacking slime. Dialoka informs him that it's a Lamborghini named after the Lamborghini chivalry, known for breaking through enemy lines. Although it's a powerful monster, he decides not to take it as Celebliss will dislike it due to its tendency to attack slime. The outsider god is angry at him for letting go of such a good opportunity. Suddenly, the Lamborghini is attacked by a snake with a humanoid upper body. After easily eliminating the Lamborghini, the snake notices Hansu and decides to take him for herself. This angers Dialoka, who jumps down from the mountain to confront it. As the fight begins, Dialoka grabs the snake's tail and starts gathering mana into her hand. Then she uses it to continuously punch the snake. As she prepares to eliminate it, Hansu suggests that they can train the snake since it can speak. While Dialoka is distracted, the snake takes the opportunity to escape but is attacked by something else, which makes the outsider god happy and states that it's a cute dragon. Examining the dragon up close, Hansu notices it's different from the dragon he had seen earlier. Dialoka explains that it's a different breed from the Dragon King Alkaiser. Then his cursed dragon's wrath, which is now called Reverse, activates, causing the dragon to become hostile towards him, 
and as it rushes to attack, Hansu punches the dragon's chin and launches himself into the sky. He then takes out his holy sword and activates his blessing fairy and outsider, along with his curse holy sword, while also using the power of meat. He then combines all of it and launches a powerful attack beside the dragon to demonstrate his strength and intimidate the dragon, which worked as the dragon cowered in fear. As the dragon looks cute, and the outsider god wants it, Hansu wonders if he should take it with him. He then asks Dialoka what the dragon eats, to which she replies that it eats everything, even steel. Since it will be convenient to raise, Hansu decides to take the dragon with him, and names it Cogmos II, which makes Dialoka pity the dragon. Now that his mission to capture a strong monster is complete, Hansu decides to return to the academy, riding Cogmos II. Meanwhile, Ohanwu is on a mercenary quest. He wonders how long the mission will last, since he wants to attend Hogwarts Academy soon. Earlier, he had visited the mercenary guild, and requested a quest involving escorting a noble or merchant to Hogwarts Academy. The receptionist then uses her blessing of observation, which allows her to look at a person's stats depending on their level compared to hers. After looking at his stats, she informs him that due to his low level and rank, he cannot take on such a quest, and the guild won't make an exception, even if he is a legendary hero. This information shocks him, and as he wonders what to do, his blessing special activates. Then a girl named Cassandra approaches him, introducing herself as the daughter of a dragon and the leader of a mercenary corps named after her. She invites him to join her corps, which is headed to Hogwarts Academy for a quest. He happily accepts, but is later disappointed, as he had thought that all the members of the party would be girls. However, there are also guys present. If he had known this earlier, he would have gone alone. Suddenly, one of the guys notices a monster, which he quickly identifies as a level 19 troll. The guy instructs Ohanwu to use support magic while they deal with the monster. As the fight begins, one of them uses a sword to attack, but it has no effect on the troll, and the guy is sent flying. Then the others also engage in battle with the troll with the intention of stalling time until Ohanwu activates his magic. However, Ohanwu is overwhelmed by the troll's presence and wonders what he should do against such an opponent. As he's lost in thought, Cassandra becomes critically injured. He realizes that the only one capable of facing such an opponent is himself, a legendary hero. While a certain wind god believes it's worth a try, but the guys who are fighting the troll tell him that they don't need his magic anymore, so he just has to take care of Cassandra. As Ohanwu is about to tell them not to give up, he is interrupted by Cassandra's blessing, Dragon's Wrath, which summons a bone dragon. She orders the bone dragon to attack the troll, and following her command, it rushes at the troll and easily eliminates all of them in the area. Later, as the guys praise Cassandra for her bravery, Ohanwu, who hadn't done anything, wonders when he will go to the academy. Meanwhile, Hansu arrives at the academy riding Cogmos II, which scares the students, so he punches it in the head to make it stay put. Hearing the commotion, the teachers arrive and question Hansu about the dragon. He replies that he found it somewhere and plans to raise it. He also uses his blessing of forgiveness to avoid getting into trouble. Later, he uses the outsider blessing to lift a heavy log and throws it far away for Cogmos II to fetch. Impressed, Celebless praises Hansu for his control over Cogmos II. While they are conversing, a student intervenes and asks for some of Celebless's time. This annoys her, as she was spending time with Hansu. She then tells the student that an important supplementary class is ongoing, so if he wants to say something, he needs to come to the office later. The guy ignores her words and persists in showing his monster partner. The outsider god informs Hansu that the monster is a rare deity. However, Celebless doesn't show any interest in the monster and tells the guy to leave. Despite her refusal, the guy insists on attending the supplementary classes, believing he's worthy. But Celebless still declines. Witnessing this interaction, Hansu decides to come up with a plan to skip this bothersome class. However, all of his plans fail in the end. Later, as Hansu attends the dark magic classes, he wonders whether the reason Celebless didn't show any interest in the baby deity is because she already possesses a phoenix deity. Then, the teacher of the dark magic class appears and uses dark magic to float a chalk. She then asks the students what they think about dark magic and explains that the theory that dark magic is evil which most people have, is wrong. It's a misunderstanding caused by a devil that was born with a long lifespan and was able to use dark magic. Hearing this, Hansu remembers that the village chief also mentioned this, 
but he decides to stop thinking about it and falls asleep. Later at night, he goes to the digging area and tells Dialoka that he learned about the principle of dark magic in class and wonders why fairies can't use dark magic, to which Dialoka informs him that in order to use dark magic, one needs to have a long lifespan. But the fairies don't have a long lifespan like angels or demons. They survive longer by stretching their lives. For example, a wound that would heal in a day for a human takes two weeks for fairies. This elongated healing process allowed them to compensate for their limited vitality by gaining additional time. On the other hand, demons have a long lifespan and quick healing rates, making fairies unable to compare. She then seductively says that the demons are also superior at nighttime activities. However, her seduction didn't work on Hansu at all, as all he understood is that the problem is the healing rate. Then, two guys shouted happily as they finally completed digging and found the ruins. Hansu then slides down the pit, and as he inspects the opening of the ruins, he realizes that it's much deeper than he had expected. Dialoka asks if he would enter immediately, to which he replies affirmatively and asks if she would like to join him. She happily accepts, and then the two of them jump into the ruin. Upon reaching the ground, Dialoka uses fire magic to illuminate the area. Then they hear a sound from behind and see a troll preparing to attack. Hansu inquires about the monster, and Dialoka informs him that it's a troll. He then draws his holy sword and easily defeats the troll. Then two more trolls appear, but Hansu defeats them effortlessly as well, though he's annoyed that his clothes are covered in their body fluid. Suddenly, his ring starts to glow indicating that the mercenary guildmaster wasn't lying about the hidden treasure. Following the ring's direction, Hansu and Dialoka stumble upon a wall with a small crack from which wind is blowing. Dialoka speculates that there might be more space behind it, so Hansu uses his blessing outsider to break through the wall. As the dust clears out, they see a room with old-fashioned furniture, and the lights are also on. Hansu feels bad for destroying someone's room. He then loudly asks if anyone is alive there. Dialoka questions his stupidity for thinking that there might be someone alive. As he steps into the room, a hand rises from the rubble. Dialoka identifies the owner of the hand as the room's inhabitant. Hansu quickly backs away and apologizes for intruding, but Dialoka tells him not to apologize to a corpse. Suddenly, a human rises from the rubble and asks how they got here, as this hidden prison can only be opened by a witch. As the man appears healthy, Hansu tells Dialoka to apologize to him for calling him a corpse, but she refuses. Then the man starts going crazy while repeatedly saying the word witch. He suddenly rushes to attack Hansu, who easily dodges and counters using his blessing outsider and the holy sword, cutting the man in half. However, he quickly realizes that the man has a regenerating ability similar to the guardian orcs, which can only be used in a certain area. He speculates that this room might be the man's designated area for regeneration so he kicks the man out of the room, ensuring that he doesn't regenerate. Dialoka asks if it was okay to eliminate the man, as he might have had some clues regarding the ruins. Hansu then instructs her to use her blessing to check the man's stats. She replies that it doesn't work on dead people, but she tries it anyway, and discovers that the man is alive. As he is rushing towards them, Hansu uses his authority as Dialoka's master and commands her to stop the man from entering the room. Although she isn't willing due to her curse, her body moves on its own and kicks the man, causing him to get stuck on the ceiling. This makes him angry, and he says that she should have sent him farther away, as he is still in the room, so he can regenerate at any time, and might even go berserk again. Dialoka ignores him as she is angry that he used her curse to command her. Meanwhile, Cogmos gains consciousness and finds himself imprisoned in an underground prison. Then, Eubora informs him that his slaves have left after regaining their freedom. Even after their curse was lifted, they initially tried to follow him. However, upon hearing that he could be executed if they remained stubborn, they left quietly. Hearing this, Cogmos feels relieved and regrets not being able to bid them farewell. Seeing this vulnerable side of Cogmos, Eubora mentions that he doesn't seem like a typical demon. Cogmos tells her not to insult him any further and to just end him. She then sincerely apologizes if her words came across as rude. Seeing her genuine apology, Cogmos is about to say something but decides not to. Instead, he asks why they spared his life. She explains that she had considered what he said in the cave, about them acting cowardly by bringing an entire unit of knights to slay goblins. Upon reflecting, she concluded that his actions were in self-defense, 
and that they were wrong to invade his territory. She then inquires about the person he mentioned back in the cave. Cogmos doesn't mention Hansu's name, but describes him as a human who knows no defeat or retreat, while levels are mere numbers to him. He explains that if it were Hansu who invaded the dungeon, all of his plans and traps would have been useless against him due to his immunity to poison and inexhaustible stamina. As Eubora presses for more information, Cogmos warns her not to pursue it, as it wouldn't lead to anything positive. She then decided to stop the interrogation and ask about his plans for the future. Cogmos replies that he doesn't know either. Relieved by his response, she opens his cell, removes his restraints, and offers him the chance to be her comrade. Cogmos questions if she's asking him to betray his own kind and join them. She confirms his assumption. Aware that rejecting the offer would likely lead to further troubles with the Saintess, and considering he can't return home in his current state, he agrees to her proposal, and she also accepts him as her new comrade. Later she takes him to the temple, where Prince Alsus informs everyone about the subjugation of the Dragon King Alkaiser. They plan to locate and subjugate monsters that have been displaced due to the aftermath of the incident. Many students refuse to participate, using various excuses. Prince Alsus states that those below level 7 are mandatory participants. Cogmos is shocked to witness heroes struggling to reach even level 10 and whine about it. He then checks one of the hero's stats and discovers the blessing of the noble, indicating that these heroes are sold to nobles. He acknowledges Saintus's cleverness in acquiring a real hero like Eubora. She asks if he wants to greet the other heroes, but he declines, stating that he's going to rest and to call him when he's needed. Meanwhile, Hansu is cleaning the room with the help of people from the Orc Sanctuary. As the cleaning finishes, he reopens the portal for them to return. He then questions Dialoka about how long she intends to hover over the man. She replies that she's done with preparations and is ready to wrap things up, but she wonders why the ancient female hero fought to take hold of a man like this. She had learned this information by interpreting it based on the morals of the ruins. Through this, she also learned that the owner of the ruin was a witch. Intrigued, Hansu asks if the witch is truly formidable. The man replies that the witch's power rivals that of gods, but the outsider god dismissed it, stating it's not even close to being possible. The man continues and explains that he was captured by the witch, who prevented him from reuniting with the female hero he loved and his child. Although Hansu understood his pain, he asked the man why he was speaking while lying in such a manner, making it less interesting. The man replied that he didn't know either, as he didn't know that the outsider god was sitting on top of him. Feeling bad for the man, Hansu decided to give him a gift as a token of encouragement. He then opened a portal above the guy, from which many gold pouches and dragon bones, which are really rare items, fell on him. The reason he's giving these gifts is so the man can live a good life. Later, Dialoka is impressed by how Hansu effortlessly raised a reliable security guard through simple conversation and gifts. And as the man was moved by Hansu's actions, he will surely protect this place and prevent further mercenary guild follow-ups until they obtain the ruin's treasure. Hearing this, the outsider god is shocked and admires his wisdom, while in truth, Hansu had just done it out of kindness. Suddenly, many trolls appear out of nowhere and rush to attack Hansu, who easily dodges their every attack. Then, Dialoka informs him that there are too many trolls, so it'll be difficult to deal with all of them. Agreeing with her, he picks her up, and as she blushingly asks what he is doing, he replies that he doesn't want to lose another translator. He then comes up with an idea, and although it's bothersome, he decides to do it anyway. He activates his blessings of outsider and fairy, along with his curse reverse, to simultaneously summon bone dragons. These dragons are initially hostile toward him, but upon seeing the trolls, they become confused. The trolls then started to attack the bone dragons, while Hansu took advantage of the chaos to eliminate all of them at once. Later, when all the chaos has settled, Hansu asks Dialoka if she is alive, to which she blushingly replies that she is indeed alive, but her ability for self-restraint is dead. She then grabs Hansu's collar, pulls him towards her, and kisses him. Witnessing this, the outsider god is astonished, but quickly snaps out of it and becomes angry, condemning Hansu. Then the ground starts to break beneath them, and they fall through to a floor below. Dialoka asks if he knew that there was a floor beneath them, to which he ignores her and wonders why everyone is after his lips. He is happy that everything settled down so easily, 
and thinks that his curse of annihilation and massacre was activated for no reason. Dialoka mentions that she is slowly getting an outline of when the runes were made as the roof they broke through is restoring itself. Such phenomena are commonly seen in ruins from the mythological age. Hansu asks if it's similar to the guardian orc and the man they had met earlier, to which she replies affirmatively, informing him that even the saintess can resurrect people. However, she cannot bring things back to life, like bringing a sculpture back to life. And when the flesh dies, it wounds the soul. However, if the soul remains unharmed, he will be able to resurrect himself, like the guardian orc. And he can also see it with his unique blessing. Hearing this, he remembers that from the very beginning, he had questions about the outsider blessing's description. And although it could be due to the inclusion of the curse massacre, he can still see the souls that have always hung around him. He then asks Dialoka if having the blessing of outsider means that if his soul is not wounded, and even if he were to die, would he be able to resurrect himself? She replies that it's theoretically possible, but she has never heard of a blessing that can directly control the soul. The outsider god doesn't like their conversation and feels uncomfortable. Suddenly, Dialoka hears the troll's sound coming from afar, and Hansu's ring starts to glow again, indicating that treasure is nearby. Since they can't keep dealing with trolls, Hansu decides to enter further into the ruins before the trolls appear. Following the ring's indication, they arrive in front of a golden door that looks like a boss's room. Dialoka informs him that her level has increased. He then asks how much her level has risen, since all she did was finish up what he had beaten. Instead of answering, she shows him her stats, which state that she is level 35. Shocked, Hansu questions how it went up so much. She explains that although she had eliminated many trolls, but her main level increase came from eliminating the room owner, who was level 38. Suddenly, the door reacts to the ring and opens. Dialoka tells him not to be surprised, as it's very basic magic. They enter the room, and although Hansu can't see anything due to the thick fog, Dialoka can see a little and is shocked by the sight of a huge waterfall. Someone inside the waterfall, who appears to be a mermaid, welcomes Hansu and calls him her dear husband. This angers Dialoka, who says that the mermaid is experience points for her to level up more while the outsider god agrees with her. Hansu then tells the both of them to calm down and asks the mermaid why she's calling him her husband, to which she replies that he's being rude, as he had accepted the ring and the blessing she had sent as an invitation. Dialoka is shocked, as she recognizes her as Archwitch Angvrora, the only one in the history of Fantasia to have slain a demon king on her own without being a hero. Angvrora confirms Dialoka's assumption and explains that in the past, she had put everything into her past love, for which she even betrayed her hero friend and trapped her loved one in the dungeon. With the hero no longer alive, her only way to seek forgiveness is death. She then uses water magic to create dragons and asks Hansu if he can grant her end. Hansu finds her request to be amusing. Then suddenly, the water dragons attack him and Dialoka. He swiftly dodges the attacks while carrying Dialoka. Angvrora is confident that Hansu won't be able to dodge her next attack since he's in the air without wings. However, Dialoka takes out her wing and carries Hansu, who tells her to throw him at the mermaid. As she did, he activates his blessings outsider and fairy, along with his curse, holy sword, and launches a powerful attack. However, despite the attack being very strong, Angvrora begins to regenerate. She then uses her water magic to restrain him. Hansu then jokingly asks why she did that since he couldn't move. He tells her to let him go, but she refuses, explaining that she had tied him up to take away his freedom, adding that heroes are too simple-minded. Hansu replies that he doesn't have a blessing like that. He then uses his meat power along with dark magic to attack her, which blows off her entire body, leaving only the tail. However, she instantly regenerates her entire body and praises Hansu for his powerful dark magic while expressing her wish for every part of him to fall for her. Hansu realizes that he can't defeat her inside the dungeon, as her regeneration ability is similar to the guardian orc whose ability only works in a designated area. So he comes up with a plan. He uses his blessings of the outsider and the fairy, along with his curse holy sword, while also gathering mana and launches a similar attack as before. But this time his intention isn't to eliminate her. Instead, he wants to send her out of her designated area so that she can't regenerate anymore. He then opens a portal and throws her remains inside, teleporting her far away from the ruins. Although Hansu is happy that he was finally able to defeat her, 
he quickly realizes that he had sent her to the orc sanctuary, which is also a ruin. Dialoka assures him that it won't be a problem, as the guardian orc hadn't reported any issues. In fact, they have another problem. Hansu inquires if it's about the treasure, to which Dialoka informs him that if what Angvarora had sent as a gift was a blessing, it means that these ruins don't have any treasure, and since the Ruin Master isn't present at the ruins, it won't be able to maintain its function anymore. This means the ruin could fall apart at any time. Then suddenly, the ground starts shaking, and both of them quickly start running away, as the ruin is really collapsing. This makes Hansu angry, saying that Dialoka should have informed him earlier, 